Hospital Port is pride and dignity. Stop the new world order. Welcome to Panwo TV and welcome to this, my second trip to the Dorthis, Dorset Earth Mysteries Group. I'm just showing you a little bit of this really nice part, the heart of Oxford as it's called. Uh, that there, that beautiful building there is the Sheldonian Theatre, as you see over the head of me. Um, <coughs> for readers of her Panwo voice will know that I actually was in there a few days ago doing something very well, quite interesting in a way. Anyway, um, today I'm doing something else which is much more interesting, I think. I'm going to Dorset and I'm going to speak again at the Dorset Earth Mysteries Group. Now, now the last time I spoke there, I actually spoke there last year, if you'll remember, and um, I spoke uh, about, this was on the 75th anniversary of the Roswell incident. Right, and so um, this year I'm going to speak about something very different. It's actually a seven, something 79 years ago I'm going to talk about this time. It is the uh, strange case of Helen Duncan. I will just actually uh, show you quickly where I'm going. And so this is where I'm going to Dorset Earth Mysteries Group. You actually have to scroll down a bit to see these. Basically it just says Ben Ellen Jones, July the 6th. Helen Duncan, the most dangerous psychic in the world. There'll be links in the description box, of course, to this group's website. It's well worth a look. And do attend their talks um, if you have time. <coughs> so, yeah, so what I've got to do now is I've got to go to the station and catch a train. Now, um, I'm, uh, I know, you know, I don't like travelling by train. I much prefer the coach. It's cheaper and it's easier. Now, obviously, it's the, the organisers of this conference are paying for my journey, but so I don't want to hit them with any more than I have to in terms of fees um, or in terms of covering my costs. The thing is, I just can't, I can't be messing around with coaches today. I don't know exactly what time I'm coming back tomorrow. I know there's more going, there's a little bit going on tomorrow morning which I have to deal with. So, uh, so I decided it's best to get the train. More expensive and less pleasant than it is, I decided I'd get the train. Um, what I've got to do now is go to head to a place called Wool. Wool, it's called. W-O-O-L. Yeah, it's a place called Wool. And um, there I'm going to meet my uh, good friend and fellow woo-woo, Neil Geddes Ward. And uh, we're going to go there together to the venue, to the Dorset Dorset Earth Mysteries group. It's actually a really nice group. And they were really good last year, if you remember. In fact, I'll put a link in the description box to the video reportage I made of my trip there last year. It's very interesting. I mean, I, was, I showed you a few things around that area as well. Like I said, I've only been to the south coast once since I was a kid, and that was it. So I'm going, it's good to be going back there now. But I, uh, so, uh, and the weather is not too bad actually. So hopefully it'll stay that way. <laughs> Come in. I think it's one of those big long ones, freight trains. There was a bit of graffiti on there too. Maybe that's something for my Oxford graffiti video. Although um, you may have noticed that uh, it's not actually Oxford, really. If the train's just passing through. All right, I'm in Oxford Station. It's a bit of a loads of building everywhere. All the Botley Road is shut. You see all those diggers up down there. That's, uh... But it's a while since I've been here. Now. Uh, Two things. Firstly, I've got a new camcorder. That's what I'm using right now. So those uh, rather shaky, inconvenient and dodgy shots I used to do with my mobile phone are going to be a thing of the past, as long as I've got my camcorder with me. It's actually quite good. It's a, it's a Sony uh, camcorder, just the same model as the last one, slightly upgraded. 
and so here we go I'm not allowed to pass there that's fine with me I'll stop here and um, and it's, it's a lot easier to use easier to transfer the files things like that so I really couldn't it, I mean I could carry on I mean I've made a couple of really good videos without the camcorder which you've seen if you're a regular viewer however it's just not the same it's, it's not quite the same using my stupid mobile phone and then it's really diff tra transferring the files from my mobile phone is difficult it keeps cutting out and I've got the interface plugged in things like that uh, the phone is is not as easy to handle uh, the controls aren't as good so basically yeah, I've got my Sony camcorder again so I'll show, I'll show you as soon as I'm close to a mirror so you can see it uh, another difference is of course I'm now officially a four-eyed git well you'll know that if you watch a Panmo voice you'll know and you'll know that I wear glasses now and you'll know well of course if you read a Panmo voice I've got an entire article explaining that but really actually you know you'll know that I have like uh, reading lenses for doing the computer because you'll notice I've been wearing glasses when I've been doing uh, videos at home lately um, but I also have long distance lenses for when I'm outside now I don't wear them all the time because they're actually uh, they actually make me feel a bit strange and things they distort things slightly so I don't wear them all the time for instance when I'm at work I don't wear them I don't wear any glasses however when I'm here at the station I need to be able to do things like read signs and, and notice boards and things like that so um, I wear my glasses for that <coughs> so I've timed this actually quite well I've got to get the train it's it's the usual fuss with train journeys that makes them so much more difficult than coaches I've got to get a I've got to get the train to Bournemouth to change at Basingstoke I've then got literally eight minutes to get to my connection which is a train to Weymouth where I'll be getting off a, a, a wool like I said so that actually is that is my uh, this, this that's what's going to take about two and three quarter hours and the leg from Basingstoke to wool actually is like most of it but if you look on the map you'll see it's actually the shortest distance so it must be a very slow train Anyway, um, I agree. Work, life's too short, work somewhere else awesome. Um, they used to have like Bible quotes and things on here as well, they don't have them now. Anyway, I'll let you know when I get on later. Have a lie. No way I'm ever getting over that, I'm going to have to start digging a tunnel. I must say, you know, this, this place generally, let's turn the viewfinder around. This place generally, like a lot of places in city centres and public areas, has become more and more uncomfortable to be in. Um, um, especially if you're a libertarian, it's like uh, you, you sense these sorts of things. There's barbed wire and there's these, these anti-climb spikes everywhere. Look at them over there, see, look, on top of that fence over there, it's like a prison. And what are they scared of, honestly? <laughs> they got CCTV everywhere. Your tickets are like a, have like a magnetic strip, they're checked every so often, they're checked regularly. I mean, what's it for? They wonder if you're climbing over and trying to get it stowing away on board without paying. I mean, what's the chance? You, how can you do that on the modern railways? I think they should do it for the hell of it. You know? I don't think they should do it for the hell of it. And um, as I do remember when I was here for St Theo's, I, I mentioned that the cafe had gone cashless. Well, only one of them has one of the things has gone cashless. Um, there's like a, I think what was it? I forgot what it's called now, but one of the food stalls has gone cashless. At least one. The other is a Greg's, and um, that does still accept cash, but I don't like Greg's. So, uh, and how long is it going to be before Greg's goes cashless? There's also like a W.A. Smith and a and an M and S. Again, ditto. Uh, the time's going to come when you know you're just going to have to like wait. I think just drink water from the tap in the toilet and wait. Oh, they're doing away with taps in the toilets as well, by the way, now. You put your hands inside of this machine, and there's this little blue light comes on, and um, it, uh, it sprays some soap on there, then it sprays just the right amount of water, and then it sprays just the right amount of air to dry you. It's like, it's all controlled, you see. Let me out of here. Let me out. Let me out. Ah. I've made it onto the train. I uh, just left Oxford a few minutes ago. Um, there's only five coaches on here, one's first class. Mid middle of the day, the train's absolutely packed. There's people standing in the vestibules. And um, I've got two, now two different recipes of where I change. National Rail said I've got to change at Basingstoke, but my phone just told me to change at Bournemouth. So uh, I'll go with the Basingstoke plan for now, unless the train's late. 
Thank goodness for Nexus. Platform 2 for the delayed 1403 Southwestern Railway service to Portsmouth Harbour. Calling at well, I made it to Basingstoke and changed on time. So now I've got to hope the original schedule was correct. It's going to wait for uh, my connection now. This is the. This train has 12 carriages. Some stations have short platforms. If you are travelling to Mitchell Dever, Botley, or Porchester, you will need to travel in the front six carriages of the train. If you are travelling to Hedge End, Fairham, Gosham, Hilsey, or Fratton, you will need to travel in the front eight carriages of the train. These robot voices never end. Okay, I've got to go to platform one now. Um, I, can't, I can't get there on time. Oh. No entry, no entry. Platform one is this way, all right then. It's starting to feel like more like one of these uh, dystopian sci-fi dramas. The train was packed. There wasn't really enough room for everyone's cases. People were leaving cases all over the aisle. And now, see, so you can't even... You've got to walk on the right side of the stairway now. So. Presumably, if on the, in the continent, they drive on the right. So they walk on the right, too, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Here we are. This just made me think about the last time I was on Basingstoke Station. It was actually when I was coming back from Devon. Do you remember my... Uh, I think it was either the sec second trip to Devon, where I went sky-watching in Devon with Diana Windsor. Yeah, I was on my way back. And I was here. I can't even remember how many years ago that was. But uh, anyway. Doesn't look familiar. I don't remember any of it. Okay, guys, I managed to catch my connection. Um, although, apparently, the train's going to split at some point, so I'm going to have to move to the front carriages or something like that. I don't know, I'm at Winchester now. Um, Winchester Cathedral, you're breaking me down. You think of the song. Um, so now, um, basically, I'm... So I'm trying to get into the mood there. You see, I've got a good T-shirt here. Some UFOs are real, and my hat, of course, is the Roswell Anniversary Limited Edition hat. So now uh, I've got quite, I've got quite a long wait when I get there. Actually, well, I thought I didn't want to be late because I've got to, Neil's got to meet me, and I've got to get to the venue and set up and everything. So I can't really afford to be late. So I'd rather be an hour early. So if the train's on time and I get there an hour early, good. Oh, we're Nexus now. Mm, we have the Southampton Airport Parkway Pass. I'm still reading Nexus here. Here's the declassified. Very good in it. Declassified. Uh, it's very good in it. Anyway, if you'd like to look through the uh, these ads in Nexus, what do you find here? Next stop is Southampton Central. Okay, where's your north of disclosure? I don't know what you're And there it is. Yeah. That's only 32 quid a month I'll put issue and I think that's pretty good value considering that's in all the English language editions. Coach 6 of 10. I think I'm gonna when we get to Bournemouth I'm gonna have to move to the front count of the coaches because the train the train splits in two or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Wait and see. Okay, I've got to move from the front half to the, the back half of the train. As you can see it's one of these trains where as you see, like it's the driver's seat there. You go through it, and it's like the actual corridor becomes like the driver, the driver's cabin there. See? All right, there we are. I think I'm on the right half now. Coach five or ten. That's it. Broken House as well before the train just divide and there's the front of five coaches going to Brexham, Parkstone, Nepal. How are the Holton Heath, Wareham, Wall, Morton, Dorset, Upway and Weymouth? If you've been currently towards the middle of the Tecco train and the platform will be dressed off. Our next stop will be Broken House Green, change of lift, turn and come to pier. Thank you. Well, it looks like I'm on the right half of the train now, but that was actually the first class compartment I was doing. So, uh, I couldn't sit there, but um, I'm here in the... I'm here in steerage now. So now over here, 
I'll be able to basically stay here for the rest of the journey, as we're hoping anyway. So, the weather's really good, so let's hope it stays that way. So, uh, welcome to Wool. There's a train that's just dropping off. Now I've got to find out uh, where I'm going. I've got to meet my friend Neil. It's very chemtraily today, unfortunately. If you look at the sky, see the see the silts and things up there. But the weather has been absolutely nice. That's old, isn't it? Look, oh, look at that. That's well old, that thing. This, I think, it may be an old station building. This is a new one. Anyway, uh, I've got to find out where I'm going. This reminds me of Pusey Station, actually. Way out. And here we are. Wool. Okay. Right, I'm a little bit early, but that's okay. I'll uh, I'll let Neil know if I've arrived. Let's get a load of those old cottages, aren't they lovely? So I'm gonna wander here, lovely weather. So I'm wandering down this little country lane now. There's these old cottages, there's some newer ones there. But look at that. Look at all those little excess things, that's something to do with the way they kept horses. That's how old these are. But the weather's beautiful. This reminds me of my walk to Cardiff, do you remember? Do you remember my Penta Skywatch video? I ended up walking to Cardiff from from, from the bloody uh, yeah. I walked all the way to Cardiff from the from the service station on the M4. Cars oh. actually contacted me afterwards. Says, "What the hell were you doing? Why didn't you just phone me up and ask, you, ask me to give you a lift?" And I said, "I could have done. I could have done." But still, it was a very pleasant walk, if you remember. Well, you would do if you can watch it. I filmed it. It's a very cam trailer, slightly hazy sunshine. So it's very nice. I can smell, I can smell flowers and it's got, a lovely, it's got a lovely smell here actually at the moment. Some flowers over there and things. Well, I'm here with Neil. You know Neil. He's been in here. Hello, been everybody. Hey. <laughs> he's been on the. He's been uh, on her Panmo TV before. Uh, he's, he's, just picked, he's just picked me off at the station, and now we're heading for the venue. It's a beautiful evening, and there's trees and the, the sunlight is everything. It's a bit chemtraily, but still, like I said, lovely weather. We're very, very lucky. Hello everyone, yes I'm here back at the Stape Hill Village Hall. I'm a little bit earlier actually, I think no one's here yet. But um, I'm going to do my talk this, this, uh, this evening for this really, really nice group of people. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a lovely evening, hopefully the good weather will bring plenty of people out. Now, do you have all I'm going to say is I'll send them a short speech tonight. Please welcome Ben, Evelyn, Jones now doing this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got this young man here doing next month. Right. Next month. Right. right. Let's go. Welcome everyone, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Can you see, I'm not in the way of that. Thanks to all of you for, for coming here this evening. Really much appreciate that. It's actually a, exactly a year ago from when I was here last. If you, uh, if you remember me talking about the 75th anniversary of the Roswell incident, it's now the 76th anniversary. This Saturday is just World Disclosure Day. Yeah, my name is Ben Emlyn Jones, and this, if you want to know more about me, you just have to put in HP a N W O to Google or the search engine of your choice and you will see me. Um, yep, I am, uh, that stands for Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. And uh, yeah, and this, that was me, sorry, it's a bit small. Uh, that was me there, the portering Buddha. I was a hospital porter for 23 years and um, I uh, actually was, I was actually dismissed in a rather strange situation that was. Uh, I don't have time to tell you about that really in, in great detail, but it has a lot of similarities to the subject I'm going to talk about this evening. A lot of similarities indeed, which I think may be one of the reasons why I became so fascinated by this particular topic, a topic of, of, of Helen Duncan. 
Well, I've just, just got a few. No, I try to do these things without notes, but uh, I will uh, go into. I'll go into. I do have a few little notes I need to look up from time to time. Yeah, this um, this story is, is one which involves a great injustice, which always makes me upset. But it's it's also there's undercurrents and there's there's some kind yeah there's some kind of subtext to everything you're going to black currents yeah. I prefer the undercurrents um, and subtexts to, to this particular case, which uh, makes me realize there's so much more going on behind the scenes. And it delves into the area of, um, of psychic powers, the paranormal, supernatural forces, uh, where it blends with things such as espionage and politics. It's a, very, it's a fascinating combination and government cover-ups. Um, those subjects happen to be some of my specialities, and this is an intersection of all of them, which is another reason why I'm really keen on this case. The central figure in this particular story is this lady. Sorry, not all of you can... I'll try and move out of the way so you can see. Is this lady here? This is Helen Duncan. Now, she was born in 1897 in Calendar, Perthshire, Scotland. And um, from, very, from the very, very youngest age, she started expressing what we would call mediumistic abilities, what she described as psychic powers. Her friends, the people who knew her, her biographers, write about this, about how from a very, very young age, she showed signs of being different. For example, um, she would experience trances as a young girl, uh, which would scare some of her school friends. And um, she, um, she gained the name, and the nickname was Hellish Nell. And uh, the reason she had that nickname, it was not really to do with her her particular abilities, even though Scotland in those days, the, the region she lived in was very religious, and um, some people were concerned she may have been involved in, with demons and things like this. Um, <clears throat> it was more to do with her personality, because she was very, very fiery and, and quite bad-tempered, and um, which, is, which is another thing. So she could fly off the handle very, very easy. easily. She, she will be, she did, and I'll describe some of those situations actually this evening. But um, her abilities were also very useful, and she did win the respect of her community. Because, for example, she, some of um, what she did was what in the modern age is known as remote viewing. For example, um, this is, you may have heard the term remote viewing, and, um, which is basically where you can, it's extrasensory perception of a different place and time and things like this. And she actually saved somebody's life that way. A man was out, um, he went out one day and it was very, very cold, snowing very hard, as it sometimes does in Scotland in winter. And he got lost and he got trapped and he um, was covered with snow and would have frozen to death. They sent out a search party to look for him and Helen, who was about five years old at the time, went with them. And she guided them to where he was before he froze to death and saved his life. She also describes how she, she would... Um, Someone would help her with her schoolwork, strangely enough. Spirits would help her with her schoolwork. She would, she would have like a little school book and she wouldn't know the answer and she'd place it underneath her chair at school. And um, then she'd look at it and someone had like written in the answers, not, in, not her handwriting, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite a remarkable, a remarkable story. Now, what happened was um, she, as she grew, she grew older, now she, was, she always suffered from poor health. Um, she married a man called Harry and... Um, they had a number of children, and they both had several jobs. He was trained as a carpenter. She worked in a bleach factory. Um, but their ill health meant they, could, they were often off sick from work. And um, so you know, they faced a possibility of bringing their family up in crushing poverty. Now, um, she decided to make use of her abilities. And of course, whether you, what, what do you think about the rights and wrongs of that will depend on your opinions of... Um, whether these things are real or not, and whether she she was for she was for real or not, because she's been accused of of being a fake many many times by many many people. But she decided to use her abilities to earn a living. She earned a, a very a reasonable living actually. She brought her family up well. They had a good income from what she was doing, which was seances. She did seances in the um, she did she spoke at spirit, she was a speaker at spiritualist churches. She did private sittings. Exactly like spiritualists do today. Um, if, she'd, if she'd been born 50 years later, she, I don't know if she'd have had the temperament to go on television, uh, probably not. But she would have been quite successful in doing the same thing as she did today. Now, um, she's actually uh, been talked about by her supporters as one of the most powerful mediums in history. She was actually part of an elite group of mediums. Um, she wouldn't just 
she wouldn't just do clairvoyance, mental clairvoyance, like saying, oh, can, I can, I've got this gentleman coming in, can I, can I come to you over here? Things like that that they do in spiritualist churches. I'm not knocking that, I, uh, I, I'm quite interested in things like that. But she was a physical medium. So she could, for example, physical mediums can sometimes produce independent physical phenomena um, out of the ether, out of thin air. For example, raps, which is just noises like that. Sometimes mediums, will you'll, you'll be with a medium and you'll hear a noise like that. Just coming from nowhere, that's a rap, she used to do that. But she was part of a very elite group because she was what's known as a, in physical mediumship as a manifestation medium. There are several forms of manifestation mediums. There's transfiguration mediums who uh, can make their face, the faces and parts of their body look different. And this is, what happens is, some kind of substance comes out of their body called ectoplasm, which has been described as being like a white substance, sort of semi-fluid, and it, um, it forms shapes and sometimes it just covers the medium's face and forms another person's face. Sometimes it actually forms into full body apparitions, ghosts in other words, that literally appear in front of everyone. But not ghosts, these are, these are ghosts you can touch and, and shake their hands and speak to and things like that. And um, manifestation mediums are extremely rare. I've, um, I've seen a transfiguration medium at work. I, um, I don't know of any, um, I don't know of any manifestation mediums that are practicing at the moment. There's, I know this guy in Australia who says he, he's seen one. I'm not seen one in particular. I'm not seen one myself, but that's what she did. And um, yeah, she, she did, as she grew older and she grew up, she, she toured the country. She went from all around the, the church circuit, doing private sittings, doing readings and things like that. And um, so that, that's, uh, to me, that's, that's fair enough, if, if she's for real. Obviously, if you disagree, you may think, oh, well, she's obviously just making money out of, out of her chicanery, sleight of hand, as magicians do, but she, she's not really a, she's just a magician who pretends not to be one. Whoops, sorry. Now, um, <clears throat> she, she became uh, quite famous, and a celeb um, so, um, uh, something of a celebrity. Not majorly, but um, you know, the media became interested in her. She did some newspaper interviews. Someone tried to write a book about her. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And um, several magazines did uh, stories on Helen. Uh, <coughs> one of them was an Australian magazine. And um, a, photo a photographer in 1928, a photographer called Harvey Metcalf took these photographs of Helen which were published in an Australian magazine. Now, uh, whenever, whenever you Google, if you Google her name, Helen Duncan, you'll come across these photographs, uh, which now, um, if you know any skeptics, they will tell you that this is proof that Helen Duncan is a fraud. This is, um, they'll say, well, look, this is, these are photographs taken of Helen in trance producing ectoplasm. And this, these are the ghosts, these are the ectoplasmic ghosts she's producing which you can clearly see are dummies. The, the faces, I mean, you can't see it very well on the screen, but I can show you, I can show you the pictures properly later if you like. Um, the dummies, as you can, are actually uh, probably made of papier-mâché and they're painted. The bodies are basically a white sheet that is draped over them, and the shoulders are coat hangers. In fact, so you can even see what kind of coat hangers they are. The one on the left is one of those art-shaped coat hangers. And the one on the right is one of those long straight coat hangers which have the little bit sticking up at the end. And skeptics, skeptics will often say, well, there, that's your proof. <coughs> Helen Duncan is a fraud because she faked, this is, this is her caught red-handed, basically faking the effect that she pretends to do, she pretends to, to manifest. The thing about it is, this is actually not, Helen, not photographs of Helen Duck, Duncan in trance. These are reproductions. These are, and Harvey Metcalf was, take, was brought in to take photographs of a reconstruction of what would happen with Helen was in trance. This was not meant to be a photograph of Helen in trance. There are some photos of her, which I'll show you in, in trance in a little while, but this is not one of them. And, um, is that her? Yes, as you, as you see here, she has ligatures around her wrist yeah. and um, pictures of people are holding her and she's blindfolded. And, and, but this, what, what Metcalf wanted to do was just, she want, just, just we, with a little bit of very simple special effects, I just want to let the reader see what it would look like, as close as we can to what will if, if you're really in trance. So there's no fraud here. 
This was, this was done deliberately as a reconstruction. And it was, open, it was described in the magazine openly. There's a guy I know in Australia who's got a copy of the magazine and it describes it quite clearly. That's what it is. So this is not evidence that Helen Duncan is a fraud. If you were in one of her trances, this is probably more likely what you would see. Um, you see here is a, is a gentleman here with this big, what the, I can't see if I can put this on full screen. I don't know why I can't. Let's have a look here, what's this? Is that it? That's better, that's better. Sorry. That's a lot better, isn't it? Yeah, you see, this is probably more likely what you would see uh, if, with Helen Duncan in trance. There's uh, this, this sort of semi-fluid, hovering, white, milky substance, which is not affected by gravity. I'll try and move around so you can all see the pictures, because some people over here can't see them. Um, this is not affected by gravity, and um, it's sort of opaque, and sort of rather like, almost like the popular image of a ghost. Um, I don't, this is, this is not a medium, I think it's just a normal person. But these things can appear spontaneously. They're not necessarily generated by, by uh, psychics and mediums. So there we go, that's what it would look like. Now, um, sometimes yes, I don't know specifically. Sometimes they appear in photographs when there's not. There's, there's a guy I know who takes photographs regularly when nothing is apparent in the room. But when he shows me the photograph, there is, there is, um, there's effects like this. And he does that regularly. So it's, we don't know in this particular example. I don't know who that person is. He's hiding in the face. Just when I got it all really working well. So let's go back to this. Right. Hang on. It's just a simple photo view. I don't know what the problem is. Okay. Full screen. Oh, sorry. That's it. Th now this is Harry Price. You may have heard of him. He's a, very, he's a famous ghost hunter. Back in the days before ghost hunters were like popular TV shows. Um, yeah, Harry, Harry Price is a famous psychical researcher who investigated. He did a lot of very, very famous investigations, including Borley Rectory, which has been made into a really good film. I don't know if you've ever actually seen that, it's worth seeing. Um, and um, along with the, the media and uh, people seeking, uh, seeking communion with, the, with departed spirits, psychical researchers also became interested in Helen Duncan. Now, psychical research is something that still goes on today, but it's it, really, it's not as popular as it was 100 years ago or so. The heyday, I think the, the golden age of psychical research was the late 19th and early 20th century. And this, this guy, Harry Price, was one of the principal figures in that movement. And he's got a whole list of, you can, you can, if you want to go to harryprice.com, um, his, his website, which has all his papers that have been written up there. I don't think he set that up himself. He died in 1948, so it wasn't his own doing. Uh, but his uh, modern day supporters um, do memorialize his work. And um, you can find out a lot of his investigations he did. He wasn't perfect though, he wasn't perfect. And he was, and um, I think in this particular case I'm gonna talk about now, we have an example of, um, he shows, a, I think, a lack of honesty. You see, what happened was in 1930, as I said, a lot of psychical researchers wanted to do studies on Helen Duncan because her reputation started to precede her. And so in 1930, the London Spiritualist Alliance asked her to go to, to go to do some tests. They wanted to test her in their laboratory. They have a, a facility in London. Today it's called the London College of Psychic Studies. I've actually been there. I did a, I saw an interview, I uh, saw a, um, a lecture by Anthony Peake there. And so um, they invited Helen to go and um, to go to their laboratory. There was, there was some kind of tendering process because there were several different organizations at the same time wanting Helen Duncan to sit for them under laboratory conditions, strictly controlled, not like in a church. It'd be like <clears throat> everything, you know, every step would be taken to make sure that there was fraud eliminated. So she uh, basically had an all expenses paid trip to London. So she got on a train in Edinburgh and went all the way to London. Now, um, as I said, there was some kind of tendering process involved in this and the LSA actually won it, yet Helen actually broke this dish. She actually signed, a, um, an exclusivity contract with the LSA, which she subsequently broke. And Harry Price was instrumental in this because un without telling the LSA, Harry approached Helen Duncan independently and asked her to do some sittings in his laboratory as well. 
And um, he said, Could, when you do this, please don't tell the LSA you're doing this. We'll do this secretly. So basically, he's asking her to moonlight behind their back. And there was a lot of rivalry in those days and um, between different psychical researchers and different psychical, organ psychical research organizations. As a result, um, Har um, there was a lot of uh, trouble. They, they all got in a lot of trouble, Harry and Helen. Harry, was, Harry Price was actually renting a room in the attic at the LSA. I actually wanted to go and see it when I was there, but they, they, there was no one there who could actually show it to me. But in the attic at the, what's today, the London College of Psychic Studies, he had his own laboratory there. And she basically tiptoed up the stairs without them knowing and did some sitting stuff for him. So she, she went into this uh, laboratory and um, Harry took all steps to eliminate any possibility that Helen was committing fraud. So he has a nurse called Molly McGinley. Helen had to strip naked and put on a, like a black boiler suit or a big long dress. I can't tell exactly which it is. And um, there's a lady called Molly McGinley would search her entire body in case she was hiding anything in various parts of her body because mediums used to do that. They used to hide things in their armpits and you know, under their breasts in the what they call the pelvic region, which, yeah, that's what you think it is. <laughs> Makes the mind boggle, doesn't it? But they did. The fake mediums used to do all kinds of things. So she was searched from head to toe by Molly McGinley, sorry, Molly Goldney, and um, to make sure she wasn't hiding anything. Then she went into the laboratory, tied to a chair. So she had ligatures around her wrists and ankles. And then Harry, and then, and then Harry said, okay, we're going to put on a red light and we can go into trance. And, um, and Harry then took some photographs of Helen in trance. And these are the photographs. I see it again. I'm going to put this on full screen just so you can see this. I'll have to reset the, the viewer afterwards, but there you go. Oh, thank you very much, Lorna. There's the first one. So that's ectoplasm Apparently, yes. Um, that is the second one. Amazing, eh? it's quite something. This is Harry Price's photographs taken in, in the laboratory in 1930. <clears throat> That's the third one. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. She's, she's wearing a black dress that covers her entire body down to her ankles, and she's completely naked underneath that. Her, her wrists and ankles are tied to the chair. She's so, she's completely, she's completely immobilized. Yeah, this is, I, I'm not sure, Helen always wore blindfolds in her seances. Now, I'm not sure why that is. I, I, I have to ask, actually. There's a few people, I think, who, know, who might know the answer. It's, it may well do, it may, it may help with the trance process. And also, it may, it may help, um, is that the last one? I think that's, yeah, that's the last one. It may also be a question of protecting her from injury. Because, um, as you'll see, as I'll, I'll describe, mediums, physical mediums and manifestation mediums in particular, can suffer harm if accidents occur during their performances. <clears throat> so these are the photographs taken by Harry Price. Um, now, it wasn't, things didn't go all that well. Helen, Helen and Harry never really got on. Um, at one point, Harry wanted x-ray her. And now there's, there's, there's several different versions of this story because the skeptics will say that Harry Price, that Harry, Harry asked to x-ray Helen to make sure she wasn't hiding anything in her stomach, which seems kind of superfluous really, but they, that's what he wanted to do just to be sure. And then that's then she started, she flew off the handle and started attacking him and swearing at him and abusing him. We do know that she stormed out of the LSA and started, basically made a scene in the streets and got very angry with her husband as well, who she accused of, of betraying her and things like that. Now that's the, the skeptic, that's the, uh, the skeptic version of this. I've, I've heard from, I've heard another side of the story, which was <coughs> she, received a reprimand from the LSA, as did Harry, for, because the LSA found out about what they were doing, doing these secret experiments behind their back, and that they were not amused because, as I said, Helen did sign an exclusivity contract with them, and Harry secretly, sneak, sneakily went behind their back, and as did Helen. Um, and that was, this was the cause of the argument, and Helen basically stormed off. She basically, she ran down to the docks and caught a coastal ship back to Edinburgh. And her husband had to travel home independently. Um, so did they mock the LSA that they didn't get around to doing the tests? They did, yes. They both they did similar experiments, yeah. but they thought they were the only ones testing Helen. Now, um, what happened after that was because of this 
there must have been some very heated phone calls between the LSA and Hatton Price at that moment, in that period. They, they both released reports saying that Helen was a fraud. Harry said that what you're seeing there was, uh, it was cheesecloth, tissue paper and egg white, which Helen had swallowed and then regurgitated. In other words, she swallowed it and then basically induced vomiting to bring it up. Just look at those photos again and see if that makes sense. Um, it's, it's, that's what he said anyway. And the LSA said something similar. And they both, they were, they were very angry with her actually, and they called her, um, he, um, Price said she was a fat fraud, and he called her a fat fraud or something like that. It's got it's very personal. And um, what, I, what I think happened was that because she essentially had humiliated them both so badly, they were kind of like, there was a kind of race to the bottom to denounce her first. This is to do with the politics between the two groups and between the two individuals. Price, the lone maverick, and, um, and um, the LSA. Now, the thing about it, the thing I, I find curious is that uh, skeptics uh, say, well, this is just magician's tricks. They can do this. And I've actually seen skeptics bending spoons. I've seen them doing cold reading. And they, you know, James Randi, you said he could repeat all the all the tricks done by Uri Geller, and he used to do them regularly on stage, which is not that difficult because Geller only had about three or four tricks. But um, he used to say, but that's all it is. That's, it's basically just magic tricks, but they just pretend they're not magic. They pretend they're really psychic. Uh, real magicians just say, yes, this is illusion. But um, what, they were, what they were essentially doing was, was, I've never seen this reproduced, the idea that you can actually swallow something, then re bring it up and then do so in, such, in a way like this, to produce this effect. I've seen people deliberately induce vomiting. I've seen some disgusting, uh, there's some disgusting TikTok videos of people doing that. Uh, but, but nothing like, you know, it's, it looks nothing like this. It looks nothing like this. What's more, um, Helen had a very, very interesting supporter as well. This is uh, Will, what's his name? Oh, God. I'm having a Joe Biden moment. How can I forget this? Will Goldston, Will Goldston. This is Will Goldston. He actually founded the Magic Circle, and uh, he was a, he was a, he wrote forty books on conjuring and magicians. He guides for magicians how to how to do magic for, for 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 on a professional level or an amateur level, different kinds of tricks you could do and things like this. And he was quite rare because he was he was a trained magician and he knew all the tricks that the fakes use. Yet he said Helen was genuine, and he said he'd met Helen a couple of times. He'd actually observed her in trance. He'd also observed her eating things. Like for example, she would do this, uh, she would do her um, manifestation after eating a meal. Now, if you're going to regurgitate something and have any hope of making it look in any way realistic, you have to have an empty stomach first, don't you? Otherwise, you'd be bringing up your breakfast as well. And there'd be an unholy mess all over the floor of the laboratory. Um, he, he said he observed her eating before and after the seance and... Um, that she, um, she was perfectly able to produce the ectoplasmic effect. And um, he, he said that, uh, yeah, he, um, he was one of her, he was a very important supporter of hers because magicians aren't supposed to say those sorts of things, you see. What was his surname? Goldston. Goldston. Now, you can't see that there, but that's, that's actually the logo of Psychic News. I don't know, you ever, any of you have ever read Psychic News? I think, is it still going on? Yeah. It used to be like a weekly, and he used to pick it up from the spiritualist churches. But he wrote this article here. Um, <clears throat> this was in the Psychic News for April 1932. So just, this was a couple of years after the Price study. Uh, just, I won't read all this, but he, he talks about who she is. And he says she's alleged to be a fraud and the methods of trickery which she is said to employ are so astounding as to be almost beyond belief. Mrs. Duncan is said to possess a remarkable power of regurgitation. Before the sitting, she swallows many yards of tightly packed and specially prepared cheesecloth and rubber gloves. All this material she regurgitates from her stomach during a seance, persuading it in some manner to simulate human shape. That, with further elaboration, cons cons constitutes the, pers the persecuting statement. Hmm. So, yeah, that's how he was important. He was an important supporter. But either way, Helen went all the way back to, she, it all went back. She, she went out from London. She left London under a cloud. She went back to Edinburgh, probably thinking things couldn't get any worse. But she was very wrong. Things got a hell of a lot worse. Into Helen's life in 1932, the same year that um, she met Will Goldston and had that, um, he wrote that 
glowing report of her abilities, she came across this woman, this someone called Essen Maul, which is a very unusual name, E-S-S-O-N-M-A-U-L-E. And um, so I don't know how, she, I don't know where she got a name like that from. <laughs> is it Eson? Is it Eson Maul? Oh, right, Eson. Okay. Eson. Uh, so there's not many photos of, uh, of Eson Maul. This is the only one in the public domain. This was taken when she was young. This is in 1913. She was actually campaigning for the suffragettes in the Sterling by-election. And that photograph was taken of Miss S. Eson Maul doing this, uh, doing this uh, canvassing on the streets. Now, she, she approached Helen and um, announced she wanted to write a book about her. She pretended to be her friend. And Eason, she actually did Eason Moore. She did some. Um, she'd actually written a novel and I believe several film scripts. And she has an IMDb page actually. So she wrote some. She wrote some uh, film scripts in the nineteen thirties. And um, <clears throat> so she she wanted to observe Helen at one of her seances. So she went to help one of Helen's local seances in Edinburgh. But halfway through, this according to Moore, um, she stood up switched on the light and grabbed the fake ectoplasm, which was, well, it was a gym slip, apparently, or it's not a gym slip, a, a lady's slip, this. Eson Small grabbed it and pulled it out of Helen's hands. And uh, Helen got crazy and threatened her and, and she had to run away, flee for her life. Helen picked up a chair and was gonna throw it at Maul um, and reported Helen to the police. And this is, this is a court exhibit. You can see the labels at the bottom there, which attached to it, which say it's a court exhibit. This apparently was on Helen's possession. The thing is, by then, see, Helen was completely naked under a big black dress. Um, funny enough, that whatever, what, what happened to her in Price's laboratory gave her ideas for future practices, because from then on, she actually, <clears throat> she, was, she was so determined to prove she was real, she actually, uh, off her completely her own initiative, she decided to go through the same um, tests, the same test, the same precautions before the seance that had been inflicted on her in Price's laboratory. So she was stripped naked. She actually employed her own nurse called Mary McGinley, who would check her for, to check she wasn't hiding anything. And um, you might think, well, if she's employed by her, she's going to be a collaborator anyway. But no, no, because she would actually do this in front of the, the female members of the audience. She would invite the ladies to watch while this was being done. So she's putting, her, putting herself through a huge indignity to prove she was real. And this is, what she, this is one of the good sides of Price's test, because she learned that from Price's study in the LSA study. So this was presented in court as the, as the fake ectoplasm that she was using. You see where it's ripped here, because a maul was basically tugging it out of Helen's hand, apparently. Um, how, how, she, how, how she sneaked that into the seance, we don't know because Helen, like I said, was checked beforehand before she stepped into the cabinet. I'll explain more about how the seance works in a minute. And, um, and Helen, but Helen unfortunately was found, she was actually um, convicted under the Vagrancy Act. She received an eight shilling fine as a result of that. And um, she swore never to work with Maul again. And now, um, so Helen, unfortunately, did have a criminal record at that point. Now, I personally doubt that that was actually the fake ectoplasm, if there was any fake ectoplasm, simply because if it's a slip and she, Moore claimed that Helen was actually wearing it under the dress, well, it's clearly, you can tell by its dimensions. There's no scale on this, but you can tell it's probably a size 12 to 14 slip. And Helen is like 20 stone. It would be, it would be, it would be wider. I, I reckon, I reckon it'd be a wider slip than that. But anyway, you can't really tell for certain. There's no real, there's no real... Um, there's no scale on there. Now, it's, Helen carried on practicing through that time, and eventually, World War II began. In 1939, Britain declared war on Germany, and World War II started. And Helen was very much in demand at that point, because there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of anxiety. And we look back at World War II as an historical event, but it was very diff different to be in the middle of it and not know how, not know how it was going to end. And um, people were dying. Um, by the end of the war, 300,000 British servicemen were killed. I think 60,000 were killed in the Blitz. And oh. she was touring the country re regularly, doing sittings with grief-stricken families, performing in various churches. And I should say a little bit about the procedure for doing a seance now. Um, as as um, I explained, 
Helen went through, went to an awful lot of effort. She went to extraordinary lengths to find out exactly, to, to prove herself right, to find out exactly how much people would believe her. She wanted people to believe her. She wanted the audience to accept that she was real. And she was willing to put herself through a lot to do that, as I explained. She, was, she employed a nurse to pub publicly to search her in front of audience members. She was, would wear the big black dress with nothing else on. And then, she, and then the, the, the idea being that she's now sh demonstrating to the audience that she's honest. She would then step into, step into what's called the cabinet. Now, the cabinet is a cubicle with curtains around it. Um, I, you, still will see, you may still see them at some seances. Um, they're not re normal furniture for a spiritual church, but you do still see them occasionally. And um, then all the, the lights would then be switched off. And sometimes there would be a small light left on. Um, Helen actually specified a single 24-watt red bulb, and it would have to be a red bulb. And sometimes her spirit guides would even request that, that the bulb be covered with a handkerchief or something to reduce its light even further. Now, skeptics will say that's because she wants to hide things, props, wires chiffon, trumpets, and other things. But um, according to believers in spiritualism, this is because bright light could harm the medium and harm the spirits, or it will harm the medium specifically when she is exuding ectoplasm. And then what would happen is the curtains would part and the ectoplasm would come out. It would actually come through out the cabinet. Sometimes people would be able to see Helen in the chair, and it would be coming out of her nose or her mouth or another part of her body, her ears. Sometimes it would just come out of her fingers. And this would form into shapes, which would take on human form usually. Sometimes there'd be other things, and would interact with the audience members. And um, it wasn't cheap to go and see these sorts of things. You know, it was, it was, she was charged at the door. But people who went along... Most of them said that it was worth it. They had a really, really great experience. Now, see, one of her regular calling points, because she was continuously on tour, was something called the Master Temple. Now, this was in Portsmouth. It was it actually it was like a room above a chemist shop run by Mr. and Mrs. Homer, who were keen spiritualists, and they ran. They had a permanent, essentially, a spiritualist church in the room above their shop called the Master Temple. And Helen used to drop in there very regularly and perform. And um, search, just one sec, I've got, got that. yeah, that's it. Now, everything was absolutely fine. She would drop in there every few months and do a performance. But then one day she did a performance. It was actually on the 25th of February, 1941. She turned up at the, at the Master Temple and uh, her spirit guides appeared. She had two spirits who would, who would come out regularly. These weren't actually for the, for the sake of the audience or the sitters. They were people, they were essentially people, spirits who acted as a kind of master of ceremonies. They would appear first and they would introduce the other spirits who were coming through. One of them was a guy called Albert. Now he was an old man from Australia. He died in the late 19th century. Another was a young girl called Peggy. And in this particular occasion, on that particular evening, Albert, came forward and he didn't introduce a spirit. He said something really quite remarkable. He said in his strong Australian accent, he says, I'm, I'm sorry to inform everybody that a British battleship has just been sunk. I have 1,400 of her officers and men with me now, newly arrived in the spirit world. Well, everyone, everyone was shocked. What's going on? Everyone was, they'd not heard anything in the news about a ship being sunk. Now, one, faithfully, one of the people in the audience was a man called Brigadier Roy Firebrace. Now he was, firstly, he was head of army intelligence for Scotland. Secondly, he was a very, very keen spiritualist and psychical researcher. He was a member of the Society for Psychical Research um, and several other organizations. He was also interested in the occult. He knew Alistair Crowley. And so he said, well, God, what's going on here? Now he, so, well, he thought, I better just check this out. So he went and he got on the secure line to the Admiralty and he said, this is Brigadier Firebrace here in Scotland. You can, you know, because it was a secure line so they could share confidential information. Is this, is a ship just been sunk? And they said, no, no, all our ships are fine. And so he went home relieved thinking, oh God, sorry, right. she's just, it was just nothing. She's probably, it's probably, probably just the spirits rambling or something like that. Then he got a call back. He got a call about a couple of hours later. Uh, Brigadier, could you come back to the office, please? I need to talk to you again on the secure line. And they said, yes. They said, we have lost. We've lost a ship. We've lost HMS Hood. She was in a battle with Prince Eugen in the North Sea off Scapa Flow in the Orkneys. 
and was sunk. And Firebrace said, uh, how many have, have uh, any of her complement been lost? It's 1,400, 1,412 to be precise, we've lost. And he was like, oh my God, how did she know? How did they know? And it's like, a man in his position would, would understand this. Not only was he, in, he was an intelligence officer and he had an open mind when it comes to spiritualism. What he realized was that information about the war was being given out by Helen Duncan. Inadvertently, she was in trance. She wasn't doing this deliberately. Through the testimony of the dead. Bypassing the normal information channels. Now, you probably all... You're, you probably all consume um, espionage fiction at some point where you hear the phrase, the cliche, we had to kill him because he knew too much. What do you do when you can't silence someone, even by killing them? Firebrace was very worried. And what he did was, and we know this for a fact because his sister showed the letter. There was a letter in her possession, which was a letter from Firebrace to the head of intelligence to, do, to uh, a guy called Commander Ian Fleming, who's head of... Um, he was actually, he's, he's a linchpin figure in this. He was head of uh, naval intelligence. He also spied on the Moscow show trial of the Spanish Civil War. He was the one most ex experienced intelligence officers in, in the country ever. Um, and he was, he was also involved in disinformation campaigns in World War II. Does the name Ian Fleming sound familiar? Mm. He also created James, he wrote the James Bond novels, which of course spawned a very successful film franchise that continues to this day. And, um, so he wrote to Fleming, and he, we know he wrote to Fleming recommending that Helen Duncan be watched. And um, he, he, he recommended Section B-19, which is a human intelligence seg part of MI5, a human intelligence um, seg um, department, be sent to watch Helen Duncan. We don't know if specifically if she's watched, but a recommendation from Roy Firebrace goes a long way. And they must have realised that the word of this will get out, and if... And if if MI5 were watching her, you could be damn sure the enemy were as well. They would have had their own agents. So when word got out about this, what, what had happened? They would have their own agents in Helen's seances to find out what they could locate. And everything went, and so we, no action was taken against Helen for a while. But then on the 25th of November, Helen returned to the Master Temple. And... Um, we had a, Albert came forward again, I'm very, very sorry to tell to inform you that another British warship has just been sunk. This time, 800 of our officers and men are newly arrived in the spirit world. And again, shock horror. This time, one of them appeared in ectoplasm. And he, had his, he, was, he was in his square rig uniform, how he manifested, with a little HMS cap band as, as well. And, um, and again, shock, we, this must have caused a lot of consternation because... As it happened, a ship had been sunk, HMS Barham, and this was not reported in the media. And this was this the information that had been sunk was was very carefully controlled. Some of the relatives, not all of them, some of the relatives of the sailors who'd been lost were informed, but not all of them. And some claim that Helen got wind of it that way. It's possible, but um, I think unlikely when you consider it holistically with the other evidence. Um, Barham was actually a major surface combatant. It was an um, Admiral-class battlecruiser, one of the most powerful ships the Royal Navy possessed. In 1941, when no one knew exactly which way the war was going to go, they'd just been Dunkirk and things like that, everyone decided, the government decided not to tell the public for the sake of just keeping up the spirits, you know, morale. It's better, some things it's better not to know, they decided. But then Helen Duncan let them know. And... Um, this, again, this, this would have had her card marked really, really badly. And um, eventually, something did happen. In, she, nothing, well, it was a few years, actually. It was not until February 1944. But uh, on the 19th of February 1944, she returned to the Master Temple and did another seance. And this time, there was a police raid. There were two police moles in the audience, a guy called Lieutenant Stanley Worth. He, was, um, he was, had his friend Ru PC Rupert Cross beside him. And uh, the, halfway through the seance, according to him, what they did was they blew whistles informing the police to come in. There were police actually parked, they had their police cars parked around the corner outside the Master Temple. And they ran into the building. So Worth and Cross blew whistles. Switched the light on, the big bright main light, not, and not the, the red light that was on. 
and the police at that signal all ran into the master temple they they detained everyone in the room and they arrested helen and cross and worth grab hold they grabbed hold of this fake ectoplasm which was according to them a bed sheet and helen was arrested just like she was in 1932 after um, eason mall did exactly the same thing Helen was expecting to go to court and go through um, something similar that she did before. In other words, she gets, um, she gets a rap for the Vagrancy Act, probably another fine, and then she just let go. But something incredible happened, almost unbelievable when you think about it. And it must have been absolutely gobsmacking and shocking for her. The whole case was escalated to an astonishing level. She found herself in the Old Bailey. She was dragged in front of the, into the Central Criminal Court of London and faced under, counts under Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735. This, it's, it's, it's whereby ignorant persons are frequently deluded and defrauded, be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid, that any person shall from or after said 24th day of June of this year of our Lord, 1735, more than 200 years ago, pretend to exercise or use any kind of witchcraft, sorcery, enchantment, or conjuration, or undertake to tell fortunes or pretend from his or her skill or knowledge in any occult or crafty science. This was a law which is basically, it, it, this was the first time it had been used in court for over a century. It was, it was literally an old statute that was dusted off. It was an old statute that had not been repealed simply because they couldn't be bothered to get enough MPs together to repeal it. Yet they, they literally took it out of the cover, they dusted it off, and they slapped Helen with this very, very... It was actually much more serious than the Vagrancy Act. If she was found guilty, she could face a maximum of nine months in prison. And here we have put this Helen and her husband, Harry, walking to the... Old Bailey. This, this became um, a major media story, actually. And this is a photograph from the newspapers. You can see her walking there towards the courtroom, looking very confused and upset over what's happened. Yeah, it was. It, this is this is nothing. Nothing in her experience had ever prepared her for this, and she must have been thinking, "Why? Why is this happening? Why? Why? Why on earth is this happening?" So yeah, this is. Um, that's the situation she was in. And so she found herself in the dock in court number four at the Old Bailey. This actually is court number four at the Old Bailey. Now, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing it pretty much as Helen would have because the, the bench in front there is the dock. On the left, you see the jury benches. There's the judges ahead of you at the far end. And then in the pit at the bottom, you'll have like the, the barristers and the clerks and other people. <clears throat> and um, so what happened? What was all this about? Well. It's important to look at the, uh, the personnel involved in this, because now the Crown chose to prosecute Helen, John Cyril Maud KC. Now, he, is, um, he has a reputation of being an excellent barrister, uh, but he was also involved. He was actually, a, I think he was head of Section B-19 at MI5. He was head of this human intelligence organisation. So which means it's almost... He, if, for example, back in 41, the order had been given to watch Helen Duncan, he would be the guy probably organising it, along with Fleming. He and Fleming would probably be the people organising it. As section, head of Section B-19, he would be leading whatever team was watching her. So it feels like, so it looks to me, you, if, if I had a suspicious mind, which I do occasionally, I would say that the, the government basically got John Cyril Maud to monitor Helen Duncan in one of his jobs, to monitor her at her seances, and then switch hats to put her in jail on another occasion. And funnily enough, Maud, Maud actually was involved in another case in court number one. And much of the, in fact, much of the time, he, he very, he, quite often he was absent from court number four, and his assistant, Henry Elam, actually uh, conducted the prosecution. Maud actually was defending a man. It's, very interesting. it's a very interesting little aside. Maud was defending a guy in court number one who'd been accused of murder in Portsmouth. And the chief prosecution witness was Chief Constable Arthur West, who's head of the Portsmouth Police. And um, the man, the, the defendant in court one, accused West of trying to frame him. And the man was acquitted. Which I think is very interesting because West... 
I mean, in, on one say, you, on one level, you could say this is an open and shut case. If you were a, um, if you were a skeptic and you had a particularly literal mind when it came to legal matters, I mean, I've read you the description of Section Four of the Witchcraft Act, and uh, well, obviously, she's doing that because she was caught with a with a with a bed sheet over her pretending to be a ghost. And this this fits perfectly with what I've just read to you. Um, and West was her character reference. West, during the sentencing hearing, Chief Constable Arthur West called her, this was his character assessment of her, a pest on society, a heartless exploiter of grief-stricken and vulnerable people. So therefore, the judge had no alternative but to give her the maximum sentence of nine months in Holloway Prison, which she richly deserved, did she not? Well, maybe something else is going on here. Maybe something else is going on here. Because um, Maud, Maud was the um, Maud was the prosecutor. The judge was the recorder of London. He was called Gerald Dodson. Now he was also had connections to intelligence and to the Royal Navy. He was a former Royal Navy officer involved in naval charities. He was very sentimental when it came to things like the Navy. Um, and he was the most senior judge in the Old Bailey. The recorder of London is, is like the, the top judge. So they, they wanted, so they got one of their best barriters and best barriters and the top London judge to prosecute Helen Duncan. As Arthur Crossley said, who was one of Helen's biographers, it seems like a huge hedge like a sledgehammer to crack, crack a tiny little nut. Now, um, Now, Helen had a defence solicitor who was not a barrister. He was not a member of any of these slippery, furtive, uh, quasi-Masonic organisations that barristers join, which are called the Inns of Court. Maud was a member of the Middle Temple, I should point out. Um, but he knew the law, he had a law degree, he, and he was a spiritualist, and he was very keen. He had a personal... He felt very strong personally about Helen's plight, and he wanted to do right by her. So he, for him, this was a, uh, this, was, this was something he conducted, he put his heart into. He didn't just have to pretend and act like some solicitors do. He really put his heart into it. Now, um, this, is, this is where it gets very, very strange. First of all, um, we'll concentrate what happened was the, the, the principal prosecution witness was Cross and Worth, the two men who'd been in the seance, who grabbed the fake ectoplasm and called the police. So what, what happened was, uh, Worth first heard about Helen Duncan when he, um, he and his friends went to a seance because, um, at the Master Temple, because he liked, to, he liked to do it for entertainment. He and his friends liked to do it for entertainment. They just thought, well, we'll go to, the, they called it going to the spooks. It was kind of an equivalent of going to the pub, you know, a lad's night out. They're not gonna go to the pub, they're gonna go to the spooks, they called it. It's not a cheap, it was 12 shillings, which is quite a lot of money in those days, but they considered it worth, they considered it worth it because it was entertaining. So they went to the, they went to the Master Temple, and they went there with the expectation of seeing something truly extraordinary, and all he saw, apparently, was Helen Duncan prancing around with a king-sized king bedsheet over the top of her. And he thought, this is not on. He, and he says, he, he thought, this is my, I'm going to bring her to justice. I'm going to do everything I can to stop this terrible exploitation of people and bring this fake, expose this fake for everyone to see. That's what he basically said. The thing about Worth was he lied under oath because Lo he, Lowsby asked him, are you a member of any intelligence organization? He said, no, sir, that's a lie. He committed perjury. He was a member of the Naval Provost's Special Investigation Division, so he was kind of a detective. And he was a very close family friend of uh, Arthur West, Chief of Police, um, as was Rupert Cross, his friend, and who was a police officer. And um, that, that really was the, the cornerstone of the defence's case. Now, the, so, so the prosecution's case. Now, Lowsby, the defence defen uh, barrister, he had, he basically brought in every single person who had been in that, at that seance, 
and to describe what they'd seen. He probably overdid it, actually. He should have kept it more simple. But he brought all of them in. I'm surprised the judge didn't dismiss half of them because they, they, they told kind of the same kind of story. They said, yes, I saw my mother, I saw my brother, I saw all kinds of things. And Mrs. Ann Potter, who'd been on the front row, she said that she'd seen her mother, who died a few years earlier, and recognised her, even the, the freckles on her face. It, when she appeared in ectoplasm, and she touched her, kissed her cheek. And there was similar stories like that. The prosecution witnesses just, they just, there were a few of them at the sounds who just echoed what Worth had said. We saw Helen Duncan prancing around in a bed sheet, right, yeah, but, hmm. There's, you may have worked out already that there's a little, there's a little discrepancy, isn't there? This was a battle basically of witness testimony. There was no forensic evidence at all. Didn't Cross and Worth grab hold of the bedsheet? Do you remember me telling you that? They grabbed hold of this king-size bedsheet and blew their whistles and turned the light on. So where was the bedsheet? Lowesby did press him on this, probably not hard enough. Worth said, oh, uh, we lost it. We lost this. <laughs> this, is, this is the most important court exhibit of all. It was like, it was like the, the slip that Moore showed in 1932. This was the fake, the supposed fake ectoplasm. They lost the fake ectoplasm. They both, Cross and Worth, blew their whistles. They switched the lights on. They both had their hands on this sheet. The police were in the room in a matter of moments. And they had their hands, both of them, on this sheet. The police detained everyone. No one was allowed out of the room without being searched. Helen was arrested. Yet this sheet big enough to cover a 20 stone woman got lost and well worth said well how did you how did you lose it i says we, we don't know we, we lost it and they said well how do you know it was there how do you how did you know it basically was a circular argument he said don't catch saying uh, well why didn't you find it we said we lost it how do you know we lost it well how else could we have failed to find it so he just used a circular argument it's pretty obvious that worth was lying there was no bed sheet. This fake ectoplasm never existed. There was lots of other, uh, there was lots of other suspicious elements to this as well. For example, um, after, what was it? After 14 entire years of, of, of a vendetta, talk about, talk about bearing a grudge. Who comes back into her life? Harry Price. Harry Price coached the prosecution witnesses. Before, before now that to me i mean i i'm not a lawyer i don't know if this is actually normal procedure but it sounds to me like an attempt to pervert the course of justice the defense witnesses had no coaching that i'm aware of at all but price came in and he was involved with the prosecution um there was lots of there was lots of other discrepancies there was in the pr initial magistrates hearings worth and cross again there was some contradictions in what they said for example they asked when they were asked about Mrs. Potter's testimony. Mrs. Potter had told everyone that she'd seen her mother in ectoplasm. Um, Cross and Worth said, "Well, that's impossible because, you know, the, the, it was it was too dim. The lights were too dim for for her to have seen, to have recognised her mother, to have seen anything." Well, the thing about it is, Mrs. Potter was on the first row. Worth and Cross were in the second row. Yet they said they recognised Helen Duncan, so it was light enough for them to recognise Helen Duncan. But it was not light enough for Mrs. Potter to recognise her mum sitting even closer. So that's another of these sort of little, that's another of these little um, rather strange discrepancies. Now, another weird thing was that there was a, a Mr. Spencer came forward who said that he had had a bet with somebody in Oxford, of all places, where I come from. Someone, someone had bet, had put on a bet that Helen Dunn would be arrested and the chief prosecution witness would be called Stanley Worth. This is before the raid on the Master Temple. And it came true. How did he know? Turns out this guy knew Stanley Worth. How did St Worth knew in advance what was going to happen? Now, Lowesby was a decent guy. I think he was a good man. He wanted to do well for Helen. He really did. But he made some fatal mistakes. He didn't... He didn't push these points hard enough because he had a plan. This is where we come on to the most interesting part of the story. He had a plan. The plan was he was going to wait for the next part of the trial after this, this battle of the witness testimonies. And then 
you won't believe this. He was going to prove, he was going to get Helen Duncan to perform a seance in court to prove she was real. I know, that's what the judge said. He said, if Mrs. Duncan is a materialization medium, then there is a spirit world near her at this moment, and a guide right here, possibly waiting for an opportunity to help her. Let us call him. Yes, here in the Central Criminal Court of London. Why not? She requires a curtained off partition and a red light, nothing more. This is the acid test to which she should be willing to subject herself to. Let me tell you, Your Honor, she is so willing. Well, the judge refused. This was a, this was a, big, this was a big problem because L Lowsby kind of gambled everything on this. Now, Lowsby appealed and he said, this is really vitally important. I mean, there may well have been some really discuss discussion of legal liter um, literal where he said something like, spiritualism is not on trial, Mr. Lowsby, Mrs. Duncan is, or something like that. But it, he did appeal, and it became pretty clear that um, this, if Helen succeeded in performing a seance in court, the prosecution would then be on the back foot, because they would then have to explain, if she's capable of doing this for real, why would she need to fake it? You see what I mean? I think there'd be much bigger implications for that, which I'll come on to, I'll come on to at the end. But um, I, I do think that that's what would have happened. Now, when the, what, what happened was the judge, after Lowsby appealed, the judge agreed to poll the jury. And so he, he polled, he, he subjectively gave the jury, asked them to vote on whether they wanted to see the seance in court. The jury said no. What, WTF? I mean, what? The jury elected not to. I mean, I find that extraordinary. I mean, if you were on that jury, would you really vote no? Would you really, if, just for your own curiosity, wouldn't you want to see that? But they said no. So that was the end of it. And that was the end of it, unfortunately. On the 6th of March, Helen was sentenced to nine months in Holloway Prison. And after the, as I said, after the character assessment by Worth, by, sorry, by uh, Art West, the judge had to impose the harshest sentence on her. Now, she had time served because she was actually, she'd been held on remand. And that, to me, is even weirder. I mean, I should, I should actually mention she was not granted bail. I mean, why? I mean, why? She's not a mad axe murderer. She, she's safe to walk the streets. She, she, you know, she's not going to run off anywhere. I mean, why was she, why was she refused bail? So she, but either way, she had time served, so she was, she was basically out by September, which is something. It would have been longer if she'd been granted bail, so... You can maybe look at it that way, but um, yeah, she was uh, she was um, she was she was locked away in jail for nine months for well, it was six months because of her, her remand. On, on in June, she actually tried to appeal her hearing and could, her, appeal her sentence and couldn't. She tried to get a hearing with the House of Lords even, and it, it didn't work. Um, now on the sixth of June, nineteen forty-four, what happened? Operation Overlord. There was a mass amphibious landing at Normandy in France. D-Day. That's what history would come to call it. And um, the D-Day was... The preparations for D-Day were, ex were extraordinary. The amount of work that went into it, the amount of secrecy, the number of people who had to know. If you think about it, I mean, like, there was a lot of training that went into it. There was even... Um, Tynum, you know Tynum, it's not far from here, I believe, village. It was commandeered, basically. I think it's, it's a museum now, you can go and visit it. But um, it was commandeered for this, the entire village. Like Imba on Salisbury Plain, it was turned into a, a military reservation. And uh, in fact, there was an accident in November 43 where one of the uh, landing boats sunk. You know, you know the infantry landing boats with the ramps at the front? You see them in the movies. One of those sunk. <coughs> not far from here off, off the coast, and um, 150 men died. And I think that may have been what caused Helen to be arrested in February 44, because they were floating around in the spirit world. They could have, they could have popped up any time in one of Helen's seances and started talking about D-Day, because there was a huge disinformation campaign. Fleming was involved in that. They were literally, they were plant, there's, there's actually a book about it. It's very interesting. Um, they were even planting fake documents on dead bodies to be found by the enemy, saying that, you know, the Allies were going to invade through Italy and things like that. They were going to, like, they were going to march upwards through the Alps and stuff like that. And um, just, to, just, to, just as a feint to draw the Germans' fire away from Normandy. 
that it, just one word would have blown it all. Maybe it's, maybe it's a good, in a way, it's a good thing they jailed her because if that case, if that kangaroo court had failed, what would have happened? Well, they, wouldn't that have come out for somebody else then? It's possible. That we, as far as we know, there was no one else we know watch, being watched at that time. But then there was no other mediums we know of as powerful as Helen. Yeah, but he could only manifest through Helen as far as we know. Oh. But, um, they, you know, I'm, I'm concerned they would have arranged an accident for her or something, you know. Mm. Now, this, this case, it, it manifests on so many levels because it's about, it's where this, as I said, you have this intersection with the paranormal and the government cover-ups and things like that. But it's actually nothing new. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing essentially new about this case. That there is the Master Temple, by the way. It's, it's above that, what's now, an, well, last year it was an estate agent. It used to be the 301 Jewelers. It was, it was actually a jeweler shop. It's at 301 Copner Road, Portsmouth. And um, the, I've, actually, I've actually filmed in there. The people who live there very kindly allowed me to, to film around in where the Master Temple was, which is their lounge now. And I, if I've got time, I'll show you the film later. I've got a little, it's just a little short bit, five minute video. But the 301 Jewelers has gone and it's now an estate agent. But that's, that's the actual location. If you want to read more, that's actually the court documents um, published by the Old Bailey, the trial of Mrs. Duncan. And this book here, Helen Duncan, The Mystery Show Trial by Robert Hartley, I very much recommend. I think this is a very, very important book. Now, there's nothing particularly new about psychic powers and warfare. These things have, 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 all, have always been walked side by side. This is Julius Caesar. He used to consult a soothsayer before going into battle. How am I doing for time? No. Right, right, yeah, okay, won't be much longer. Um, Alexander the Great used to have a, he actually took a soothsayer with him on his campaigns and he used to consult this soothsayer all the time before going into battle. And in 1492, I believe it is, it? Yes, in, um, in 1429, the King of France put a 14 year old girl in command of his army, Jeanne Roumet, a little, little girl from a village in France called Arc, and um, she, uh, this was, a, yes, Joan of Arc, she gave the, uh, under her command, the French army gave the English a whopping at the Siege of Orléans. Unfortunately, the English captured her and burned her at the stake, but um, the legend of Joan of Arc lives on, and the reason the king did this because he believed she was receiving divine messages from God. And uh, this, this carried on through, as I said, World War II, the Nazis had Sylvia Ortiz, the medium, they had a very open mind when it came to things like that. They had Heinrich Himmler of the SS. And in the Cold War, even though, um, technically speaking, this was all mumbo jumbo, that's what you always hear through official channels, secretly the governments on both sides in the Cold War were very interested in this sort of thing. And they used to, they had what they called remote viewing, psychic spies. There's a good film called Third Eye Spies, it's worth seeing, I think you can get it on YouTube. Uri Geller was involved in that. He spied for Mossad and the CIA. There's another guy called Ingo Swan who wrote a book called Penetration I very much recommend. So there's nothing really particularly new about this in a sense. This, there's always been this supernatural element to the military, to politics and to conflict. This is, uh, this is a newspaper article here. Jailed as a witch, branded as a spy. This is from 1994 on the 50th anniversary there. That's from the day, one of the red tops, I think. And this is Helen in later life. This was after the witchcraft trial when she was released from prison. Um, when, she, when she was released in September 1944, she went back to practicing as a medium. Uh, but I think a, a lot of her spirit was broken, I think, in that particular, in her experience. She was very bitter, she was angry, she was resentful that she'd been subjected to this miscarriage of justice. She was especially angry that she'd not been allowed to perform in court, which she knew would have cleared her name. But she carried on practicing. Um, the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was repealed in 1951. There was, contrary to popular belief, Helen was not the last person prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act. There was, someone else was, but there was, no, there was no imprisonment as a result. Helen was the last person to be imprisoned under that act. It was replaced in 1951 by the Fraudulent Mediums Act, 
which itself was repealed in 2008, and there's been no replacement. By that time, spiritualism was officially recognized as a religion and therefore was protected under right to freedom to worship. Skeptics these days, I think they regretted the passing of these laws and they'd like to basically stamp it all out by force. And in fact, some of them have actually said that to me. They said if they could, yeah, they'd outlaw it. But um, they now use existing consumer legislation to try and, um, to try and um, what they say, fight the fakers, to quote James Randi. On the 28th of October, 1956, Helen performed her last ever seance at the West Bridgeford Spiritualist Church in Nottingham. I actually went to that location. Now, there is, the West Bridgeford Spiritualist Church is actually it not, it's got its own premises, but it used to be in someone's house, like the Master Temple. And I went to the house. I didn't knock on the door, but I was filming outside, and someone came in, and someone came out and told me to go away. And they said, can't you? They knew what I was there for, you see. They, maybe they recognized me, I don't know. Can't, just let it go, let it go, and I thought, even after all these years, this was only like about 10 years ago, even after all these years, it still, it still bothers people. The family who, run, who ran the church there still live at that address. But I, did, I filmed in the street outside, as is, um, some have a right to on a public highway. And I did a, a brief commentary on what happened. And um, yeah, Helen actually, there was another police raid at that particular, her, her, final, her final seance was, was loaded with the same drama that many others in her life did. The police raided again. Again, it was the switching on the lights, things like that. Now, Helen suffered serious injury during this raid. She actually suffered second-degree second burns to her chest and neck. And many um, mediums and spiritualists will tell you that if a medium is disturbed, if a manifestation of medium is disturbed in trance, they can suffer that kind of injury. It's like an electric shock, almost like a lightning strike. And it's caused by the ectoplasm being disturbed, being disturbed when it's outside the body. It's like some of the body's energy is outside of, of your body and it has to rush back in again and that causes heat, friction and burns. Um, Helen was examined by a local doctor, she was treated for the burns and then returned to her home in Edinburgh but she was never the same again, she died on the 6th of December. Now I know people, she was not a well lady, she had all kinds of health problems, she was seriously overweight you know, but so was Elvis when he died and no one holds that against him. Yeah. Um, Helen was, uh, yeah, Helen was, um, she was not a well lady. But judging by the fact that her health deteriorated after that, after the West Bridgeford incident, it's quite likely, in fact, it's, it's quite certain, I think, that that killed her. It shortened her life considerably, and she died. However, her family have been, her family are still in touch. Her family report that she's still in touch with them regularly, including a lady I know called Margaret Hahn, who's Helen's granddaughter. Yeah, I know. She still uh, she's uh, she keeps on she keeps on people. Yeah, there's a pardon now to camp. There's a campaign to pardon Helen Duncan from her, from her, um, for because of her prosecution. I mean, there's a. Uh, firstly, I mean they believe. I mean, there's, it's two pronged really. This has been going on ever since she was convicted. There's a two pronged uh, assault on the government over this. Firstly, the unfairness of her conviction should be basically that that the the verdict itself should be overturned. Secondly. The fact that she has been prosecuted for an, a statute that was then repealed. And as a result, she could receive a pardon for that. And now, there's been no success for a while. There wasn't any success for a while, but then there has been a development since then, which may lead to Helen's, Helen actually being exonerated. Do you recognize this chap? That's Alan Turing. Now, he's a, he was a computer genius. In fact, he was the first computer scientist to come up with the idea of artificial intelligence, which we're all very familiar with today. If you ever use chat GPT, this guy was the first, he was the theoretician who first came up with this idea. Um, he was also one of the most important people in the entire British war effort. He did, he, uh, using his, the computer he designed, he deciphered the supposedly unbreakable Enigma code that the Germans were using, which, uh, had a, which was a huge benefit to the Allies. Um, he should have been the greatest war hero of them all. He should have had a, a hero's welcome, medals and things like that. But, but it was not to be. Now, the story of what happened to Alan Turing after the war is it's tragic and it's shameful. Um, in 1952, he was convicted under the Labrucheret Amendments of the Sodomy Laws. 
for indecent acts with another man. Basically, he was an out-of-the-closet homosexual, which is perfectly acceptable today. No one cares. Very few people do. But it was a crime in those days. And he was, he was, well, he didn't actually go to jail, but he was often an alternative to prison. The alternative was that he was to receive medical treatment, supposedly to turn him straight. What this medical treatment did was it ruined his physical and mental health. In 1954, he committed suicide. Now, ever since he died, ever since he took his own life, there's been a campaign to pardon him and get an apology from the government. And in recent years, they have succeeded with what's known as Turing's Laws, as an equivalent in Scotland. In fact, Nicola Sturgeon did actually stand up and make an apology to all the people which were, who were prosecuted under the Bruchet Amendment. It was repealed in Scotland in 1980. It was repealed in England in 1967. So what's this got to do with Helen Duncan? It's an identical legal situation. There's a court case, you're prosecuted for a crime, put in jail. The crime is then, the crime is, is then no longer a crime because the statute is repealed, so you're no longer a criminal. Well, you can then say, well, why not just let him off then? Give him a pardon. I mean, this was a bit dodgy at first because several people were saying, yeah, yeah, but you know, it was a crime at the time. You can't just keep running the clock back and things like that. But no, no, he has had a, he's on, well on the way. I think he has been offered a pardon in Scotland. There's been an apology as well, not just that it was a crime, but it was an injustice. And it, it's the same thing with Helen. It was both a crime for a statute that was repealed and it was an injustice. So I think Helen now stands a good chance with this common law precedent. But there's more going on here. Now, I don't have time to go into this in detail right now, but... When Gerald Dodson refused to allow Helen Duncan to perform a seance in court, of course it was, this was very, very important for the, for the court case, but what would have happened if he had said yes? What if the jury had, the poll of the jury had come back, yes, we want to see this? Helen would have had a, she would have had a cabinet set up in court, she would have done a seance in court, then what would have happened? People say, yeah, well, she'd have been exonerated. That would be it, she'd have been, she'd have been acquitted. But that wouldn't be the end of it, would it? What implications would that have, first in legal precedent, but also in historical precedent, in scientific precedent, in political precedent? This would essentially be saying, well, life after death is a real thing, and we proved it in court. Now, that's, that would have far, far greater implications than simply a, a woman not going to jail. It would change the world, wouldn't it? Now, when, last time I was here, one year ago today, I told you about the, some of the reasons why I think governments are keeping the existence of the, the fact that extraterrestrial life is engaging with us, key secret. Maybe there's a similar situation with the afterlife. Maybe they're keeping that secret for a similar reason. Every single new discovery, every single new product that comes off the production lines, their teams of psychologists working at organizations like the Tavistock Institute, the Stanford Research Organization, that assess it to find out what effect is this going to have on the public? How are they going to respond to this? Will it be good? Will it be bad? You, you may be familiar with the, um, the, uh, the Brookings Institute report from 1959 about extraterrestrial life, where they recommended that it probably wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a good idea to shout this sort of thing from the rooftops because of the effect it would have on the culture, on the psychology. I and mean, they literally, I think they literally see themselves as the sheepdogs of a human herd. It's a very contemptuous attitude they have for us. But maybe this is one of the things they're keeping secret from us. The fact that when you die, well, firstly, it's not a case of having to, because we generally have two choices in this world. You can buy an off the shelf religion where you have a priest or a mullah or a rabbi, and he holds, you know, and. You, you see the divine through the eyes of that particular religion. Or you can say, well, there is no religion at all. There's no God. There's no spirituality. It's, everything's material. Your brain is a machine and your consciousness is a product of that machine. When that machine switches off at the end of your life, you disappear forever. You really only have a choice of those two things, don't you? But what, you see, what if, there was, what if they turned out that neither were true? What, what effect would that have? Now, how many of you have seen this, the discovery? I'm really curious, have any of you seen this? It's, it's on Netflix, but you, you can get it in other places as well. Now, this is, a, this is a film. Do go and watch it if you get the chance. 
This is a film stars Robert Redford as this scientist who discovers proof of the afterlife. And the, the, uh, the film discovers the, the, legal, the, the legal, the social, the cultural implications of that. And um, one of the implications is that is, is that everyone starts committing suicide. <laughs> and now, I personally don't believe that would happen in, that, in this kind of scenario. But I get the feeling this film is kind of a skeptic fantasy. I think they, 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 <laughs> the skeptics literally think that, yeah, if, if people knew there was an afterlife, it would reduce the value of the life we're living now. I never quite understood why that is, but they're convinced it would be. In fact, Richard Dawkins even said as much. He said, I think there is a nobility in, in believing that this is the only life you get and that's the end of it. I think if we believe there's an afterlife, it's, it's kind of like a, a, any number multiplied by infinity, which is zero, which means that the value of this life is zero, is nothing. Now, I, I don't think, I don't agree with him at all, but that's what, I think that's what a lot of skeptics think. I think some of them, maybe, I think maybe Randy was one of them, are getting involved in skepticism and debunking, not because they don't believe in the afterlife, but because they're terrified of what would happen if everyone else did. That's something I wish I don't have time to go into that in detail with you now, but it's something maybe I'll prepare for another talk in the future. Yeah, sorry to leave, that, sorry to leave you on that cliffhanger, ladies and gents, but there you go. Um, now then, if you're interested in the kind of things I talk about here, I have these books here. Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure, and there's the two sequels. They're £10 each. Come over here, I'll sign them for you. Be worth a lot more than that in a few years, I'll tell you guys. And... Um, what we'll do, I think, I think Lorna, we're going to take a break and then... Yeah, yeah well, do you want to have questions and answers now? Yes. Yeah, sure. Stop. Yeah, sure. We'll, so we'll, we won't have a break, we'll just do that now. Okay. Anyone questions and comments, anybody? Neil? Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Mm. You mentioned the Orkneys. Yes. To do with the ships. Don't ever say the Orkneys. <laughs> oh, sorry. Orkney. Because I live there, and they yeah. hate it being the I know. It's like one of Hawaii, Hawaii's. Uh, yeah. Is, 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 is actually a county. So it is a group of islands off the coast of Scotland, but it's a county of Orkney or the Orkney Islands. I met John Hill once. If you ever yeah. call the, the Orkneys, they're struggling. <laughs> I met, yeah, I met John Anthony Hill, who he wrote The Stolen Isles about Shetland, yeah, and I interviewed him. Shetland. Captain yeah. Calamity, yeah. Uh, he said, always call it Shetland, yeah. Yeah, always call it Shetland. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, the other thing is, um, you mentioned that the skeptics wanted to do the, um, I forget what it was now, through kind of, um, I don't know, but instead of through, through the uh, Witchcraft Act, they were doing it through... Uh, oh, the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Yeah, they, they were doing it through something else, you said. Yeah, the Fraudulent Mediums Act, 1951, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, through, through consumer. Consumer protection, yeah, yeah laws, yeah. I just wondered if that was through which magazine. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's my piece. <laughs> Funny enough. Did Churchill have something to say about it? Yes, he did, yes. Yes, thanks for reminding me, yeah. Um, I actually left that bit out and I shouldn't have. Yeah, um, there's a lot of people have claimed, they made a lot of claims about this, that... Um, that Winston Churchill organised this hall because he was basically a, a, a he was a woo woo freak like us, and it's true he was a believer in spiritualism. When he was in the Boer War, he said he he had a remarkable experience when he was trapped behind enemy lines. He felt that God was helping him, um, and he actually but he knew, no but he actually sent a memo to the Home Secretary saying um, basically. He said, let me have a report on why the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was used in a modern court of justice. What was the cost of this trial for the state observing that witnesses were brought from Portsmouth and maintained here in this crowded London for a fortnight? And the recorder kept busy with all this obsolete tomfoolery to the detriment of necessary work in the courts. He didn't know anything about it. He was kept out of the loop. Um, he was, so one more, I'll be with you in a sec. Um, he, there's a rumour that he actually visited Helen in jail, which is not true, according to his granddaughter. Sir? Hmm. One of the things that uh, is, I think widely known is, when they chose the date for D-Day, they had somebody who went through Hitler's birth chart and found the times which was most unfavourable for Hitler. Really? He wanted to choose a day to go over. <laughs> I think it was someone like, was Alice McLean or somebody was one of the people that was involved with um, Alice McLean? It wouldn't surprise me. Alice Crowley was an, M Crowley was an SIS. They consulted hmm. someone to pick 
Hitler's worst day on his chart. Blimey. I didn't know that, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. You mentioned Crowley. Crowley was in SIS, and the fact that he travelled so much wouldn't mean he would have been approached to be recruited anyway. But he was, he was also went to Trinity College, Cambridge, where there's loads of spies there. <laughs> there was, a, there was Phil, Philby Blunt, Burgess and McLean, but there was, both sides were recruiting there. And so, yeah, um, that wouldn't, I didn't know that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, behind the scenes, they, the government, they call this mumbo jumbo, but they've always had, they've, that's, that's their public line. Their private line is something very different, just like with UFOs. Is anyone else, would anyone else have yeah, this? Sir? She was in prison. She would have been very, very badly treated because Holloway Prison in that time was a very disgusting place for me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, she she came out of there a broken woman. I mean, she, she you could see by the you could see the look on her face. The, the when she's older, you can almost see the she's world weary, and she never got over that. I don't think. I mean, if being in prison was a terrible experience. The way she was put in there again was a terrible experience. Um, she must. She, she actually, you know, when she was, she never spoke during the trial. She she never gave testimony. But um, as she was taken down, she she cried out in anguish. She says. Uh, well, I haven't, I haven't done anything. Oh, God, is there a God? She said. That was the only word she spoke during the trial. Yeah. Neil? Yeah, it's just, it's not a question. It's just uh, because she showed the Hannah Duncan tribute website there, which I've looked at myself no. and read in quite detail. And I would recommend, if you're interested, do go to the Hannah Duncan website because there's letters that people have actually tendered as sales have written in in support of Helen Duncan. One of them had a fascinating tale where they said they saw many wonderful things, and this is handwritten, you can see it, where one of them on the sales is uh, she manifested a Highland Scots piper with bagpipes and his big flock. <laughs> Got a shout. But also coming out with this Highland piper was a Shetland pony, literally coming out no. of the sales cover. Mm. And he said that the Shetland pony bowed its head up and down like Shetland ponies do, sort of thing. Mm. And, it, you know, if she's supposedly you know, spewing this stuff up, <laughs> as they claim, how on earth could you manifest a highly type of yeah. Shetland pony? I must say, I've never seen a manifestation like that. Victor and Wendy Zamet, my friends in Australia, they have said they've seen full manifestation mediums at work. I have seen a trans. I have. I've seen a, a transfiguration medium called Jason Harrington, um, who's very interesting. I've done a full report on my channel about this, um, where his hands change shape right in front of me, and I was sitting as close as as this lady is to me, and I saw his hands change shape. His fingers stretched. It was very weird. His nails turned bright red. Very, very weird that was. Um, anyone else? Think of anything to, to say? Thank you very much, Ben. You. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for, let, me, let me know if you want me to come back any time. I love this group. You guys are great. Thank you. I've done my talk. It went very well. Had a really, really great time. There's lovely people here. We're just leaving the village hall now and I'm going to go and have a rest, I think. I think I've earned it, so uh, great stuff. Well, good morning, everyone. It's Friday. Um, I had a very, very good night's sleep, which is, which is um, I, really, I really needed, actually, after um, such, a, such a hectic day, all that travelling and then doing my, my, my uh, presentation. And I've just slept like Rip Van Winkle. And, um, and it's a beautiful morning here in Weymouth. You see how it's... See? And the chemtrails have gone as well. And I'm sitting here in this lovely room here, which is full of Neil's artwork. I showed you, I think I showed you some of those. I thought, um, as Neil and Monica both um, have both contributed to these paintings. And um, this room even has its own washing machine. Yeah, so in case I want to do any washing in the night, I can. <laughs> so, um, well, um, I don't have to, I'm not going to go home straight away because uh, Neil and I have got a couple of things planned. So, uh, I'm just going to have some breakfast and then I'll show you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading up to Portland now. Um, I don't know if you can hear me because there's a bit of wind, but uh, it's a lovely day. The chemtrails are gone. And you can see, there's the sea. You can see the sea, yeah. Look at where we are. Now this is a, this ladies and gentlemen is the sea and it's, it's a perfect day for it. And we're at Portland, this is, where are we now? Portland Bill. This is Portland Bill, we're on the top of a high hill by the sea and if you look on your map you'll see it's a peninsula 
and there's like a, a, a there's a I've got the word what they use for it. It's like a sedimentary beach. We're going to come to in a minute. Oh, that's the yeah. The um, chisel and, beach. Yeah, chisel beach. Yeah, and we have here a war memorial. Which I, I hate these things. In memory of our glorious dad, 1914 to 18. And for those who, uh, of course, like me, who've seen people who've died in wars and had to deal with the injured, people who've been injured in wars, there's actually nothing glorious about it at all. Quite the opposite. But there you go. That's why I can't stand those kinds of memorials. Yeah. Oh, look how many names there are. God. This is just from this local area. All those men were killed. Horrible. And um, look at the view, man. Look at that. That there is Chesil Beach, which is a sand spit at near Portland Bill. And Neil and Monica have taken me here to uh, to this lovely location. And the, the chemtrails are gone. Yeah. And look, look at that. Look at the sky. Look at the sea. Look at the sea where the sea and the sky meet. You may not want to hear me very well because it's a bit windy. Down there is the, that down there is Portland. You can see it all down there. This is lovely. Now Neil here. I don't know how much you can see. There'll be probably some wind on the mic. Neil, what is this? Well, we're not American, and this is by no means. Oh no, that's not going to go in there. It's not going to fit. Oh, we're going to have to. Oh, we, I don't think we didn't check. We're going to have to send this American back, back to China. It doesn't fit. <laughs> oh. We'll have to hold it. But it doesn't fit well, the actual flagpole now. It fit the flag. Oh! Okay, okay so... <laughs> We're going to do an experiment here, but the flag is flying quite nice. It's not flying. We're not anti American here. We have a lovely gum old boy there, the We're going to see. Um, we're going to test this with some water and see if we can spot the damp dry flag. Still need to hold it because yeah, um, you hold it one end because it is because the wind will blow it over yeah. otherwise. Nice. Yeah. Oh. That's well. Yeah, we are. Down, there's some damp bits on it. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, oops, what's, oh dear, what we're going to do, don't worry about that, we'll fix it in a minute. What we're going to do is we're going to see how this dries, whether it dries along the seams quicker than it does there where there are not seams. Because okay. technically, it should dry quicker on the seams, okay. on the, on the, less on the seams. Because, so, uh, what I'm going to do is also take some photographs of it in case the camera doesn't pick it yeah, up. Yeah, sure, no problem. They should do. Yeah, I can see the depth. 
damp now um, because I'm just trying to think of where the sun was in the Apollo photographs. So I think what I might do is move your camera for you. Chill. Here we are guys, well, this will hopefully solve the long lost mystery. <laughs> this is the water and flag equivalent of Peter Hyatt. <laughs> it's a magic wand, we wave and we know everything. It is, isn't it? It's, yeah, if I let go, it'll fly away. Right, let's just move around this way slightly and Ben, stay there. So I stay there Ben, move back into position. A um, bit more, back that way. That's it. Now, Mark can come round to the left a little bit, the right. That's it. Just so we got the angle on it a bit better. So we can see, because what's happened, we get, we're casting a shadow right across the centre here. And what I'm going to do is catch the light into the. That's so if you, really tech, yeah. yeah, just move over this way. I couldn't do this by myself. Yeah, no, it's, it's a three. I mean, they should have said three astronauts for this one. <laughs> three man job, but I'm not a. Unless you're on Netflix. <laughs> Turns out you self-identify. <laughs> oh, right. So if I hold that like that, that's quite damp now. And I can see dark patches. Mm. So I see dark patches here. There's a light patch and a dark patch. Dark patch, light patch. Dark patch, light patch. Dark patch. Light patch. Dark patch. There's a really good example. I'll zoom in on that bit. That bit out. Um. That's the idea though, we, we see it's how we dry it. So if we go there, don't you see that? Right, hold that there, there's some water. Do it again. Now, not 100% the same material as the no, certain no, sea. Right, do you want to pull that out a little bit, just try and get rid of the, that's it, stretch it as if it's, you can see that, drying back, dark patch, light patch and, and it, it's not the shadows because no. the light is fully on it from yeah. the sun there's my shadow with the model and you can definitely see the shadow there of the dark wet damp we'll do it again Whoops. i'm gonna be one thirsty astronaut isn't it? Um, <laughs> so pour it on there we go look you can definitely see the dark shadows and it is dry now Still, we have a nice clean flag at the end. Yeah. No disrespect to the American flag. No, we're, we're, merely treating with, just we're treating it with reverence. You know we're not Yanks. We're not burning it. We're actually uh, just testing out whether it dries back or not. And obviously we want to replicate it because it's an American flag. We could have used a British flag, but the argument is saying, well, it's got to be an American flag because it's an American flag on the moon. So that's why we've ordered well, an I'm sure, I'm flag. sure that the Apollo believers will pick holes in them no what we do. Yeah. But we don't want to make it easy for them by having the wrong no. flag. No, no, that's right, that's right. So again, um, just move slightly to your oaks that way, Ben, just to try and sort of see if that... Yeah, I can definitely see some shadows there with the damp. So, I'll zoom out a little bit now. Okay, so I can definitely see some signs of damp. Okay, what we can do, I think, if I just press stop on your camera, Ben, or you yeah. want to say something to camera, whichever you want to All do. Right. Well, we are now, we've just began this little experiment. We're going to continue it in another location now. But this is, uh, basically, we're trying to reproduce an experiment of what was done on Apollo 16. The claim made by Scott Henderson... 17. 17. The claim made by Scott Henderson that there's actually, wa that there's actually water on the flag which the astronauts put up on the moon. And we're just going to test, we're doing a little experiment to test to see if that's possible. 
Okay. Good. Mm. All right. So I don't. I'll press stop for you there. Yeah, that's it. I don't know how much people can hear of us because I think we have to speak quite loudly, Neil. Okay. So that, that's Chesil Beach. Yeah, so you've got Chesil Beach there, all going all the way down there, all the way over to Bridport. And, uh, so that's Weymouth over there. It's supposed to be one of the Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders, yeah. yeah. So is it on the I'm not sure. Quite a lot. You can see so, so much water. Here, on the right side of that stretch of beach goes all the way around the coastline as well. And that's where the Dam Buster, the... Um, uh, the planes that dropped the bouncing bomb tested the bouncing bomb all along that stretch down there. They also tested it in another part of the UK, I can't remember where it was. Mm -hmm. um, but they, this is another secret testing location where they dropped dummy bouncing bombs to see if they actually skip across the water. Yeah, it's all done there. This is the famous raid where the, the RAF destroyed a dam in uh, the Ruhr in Germany. And that is where they tested the famous bomb which bounced along the surface of the water like a stone skipping on the one. And over there's Bridport, you say? Bridport, the Jurassic Coast, it goes on to Lyme Regis down that way. You know, I've been to Bridport. Um, I, there was a David Icke Forum meetup there oh, right. years ago, I think around 2000, 2010, something like that. Oh. And I remember I, was, I camped out there oh. in Bridport, yeah. Oh. yeah they had a lovely time. Destination. Nice, <laughs> yeah. nice fill, um, place. It's beautiful, Bridport is a beautiful yeah. area, yeah. There's a very distinctive, I think I can see the cliff, there's a very distinctive shaped cliff at Bridport. Yeah, yeah, there's a very distinctive shaped cliff at Bridport, which is like, a, it's, you can just see it, I probably can't see it very well on the viewfinder, but, yeah. There we go, it's like a like, lump of cliff there. There we go, so, and that Chesil Beach there's this eight, nine mile long beach all the way to Lyme Regis, so along the yeah. coast. Um, I think on Portland Bill we can see so much. You can find old historical footage on YouTube of the bouncing bomb being tested mm. on there, so it's black and white. Yeah. There's a very famous uh, movie made about it as well. Yes. As well, the Dan, um, the Dan Buster's Stars film, Stars. yeah. He's the inventor of the bouncing bomb. Mm. Yeah, and so, and on, and this, like I said, the weather could be better than it is today. So we're going to explore and have a look at a few more places. And we have here the Olympic rings. And this, as Neil was saying, is because for those of you who remember the 2012 Olympics, and you may you may have been, been expecting the fake alien invasion, which never happened. But if you had if you had been paying attention to the actual sport, you'll know that this area is where all the sailing took place, and it was all done here. And so they've got these Olympic rings. And um, and the thing about these, what's interesting is. Um, that, that no one's complained about this because you know that the, the these five ring symbols they're very very jealous when it comes to copyright what the olympic thing. yeah i actually went to the i went to the olympic stadium in sydney when i was yeah. over there and uh, this was just after the olympics and they took they taken down all the olympic stuff and then i asked them and they said well where's all the five rings and stuff and all they said all the olympic stuff is copyright and we have to remove it right. yeah. there was a bloody bakery in this is crazy it was a bakery that put some bagels up in this formation in their window hmm. to celebrate the oh, Olympics. Really? Okay. And they had to take, they would, they, someone, they threatened, the Olympic committee threatened to take, they said, you have to take us down or we'll sue you. Good grief, can you believe that? Let's have a look around here, there's a warning sign on it here, what's it say? Danger! These rings are very dangerous and could, be, could harm your health, no. In the interest of public safety, please do not climb on this sculpture. All right, all right. What's all there's a steep cliff here, I think. I'm not gonna fall off the cliff. Oh look. Look at that view of the town. That's amazing. We've come to this quarry, this is the Portland Stone Quarry. And um, already I can see something that resembles a cross between Avery. Oh my god, what's that? It's like there's a sculpture here. It's actually an octopus. You look at oh, it's an octopus. octopus. Yeah, you see, yeah, there's the legs and stuff. And it reminds me of a cross between Coral Castle and Avebury. Yeah. But you can see there is distinctive shapes coming out of here. There's a humanoid shape there. There's a lady there. It's half a lady. It looks like this, that one's half done by the look of things. It was started and not completed. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the. Oh, yeah. This is very Coral Castle-like. Yeah, so you've got like a, uh, I think a 
almost like a raptor or something there on that one. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a dinosaur, uh, some half bird, one of those half bird, half dinosaur things. And there's a bear's head coming out of that one, you see. There is, you're weird. That's strange, isn't it? Yeah. And then when you come around this side... That is like, the fact they're sort of like half, they're not like complete sculptures, it's like they're emerging from the natural rock. That makes it very strange looking. And again, this one, you've got, um, I think they've taken the shape as inspiration. It's like a crocodile or yeah. a nostril there. Or the it's the arm. eye and a nostril. You come around this side and there's the bear coming out the stone. That's very unusual. It's a very unusual style. Look at it. This is just like Coral Castle. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah. So this is a roly thing you can do on this. That's what the noise is all about. Oh no, right. it's a there's like his table in the middle of the room. It's like the stone table from Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe. And uh Not there's a there's these seats, these little these are people sit around here. And this thing here is a, it makes he makes a noise. Put a bit of stone ground flour in and away you go. Is that what it's actually for? No, I don't know what it's, it's for actually. It's full it's of holes, it's, got, it's, made, it's like pumice or volcanic stone, it's full of holes, but it's like... It makes that really, almost metallic noise. Yeah, it's a, it's a resonance in this bowl shape, it's a bit yeah. like those sound healing things, isn't mm. it? I thought it was, I thought was some, there was something metal here originally. No, no. Um, we have... Now, over here, you see the, the Roy Dog, which is quite interesting. The Roy Dog. What's this here? Is this... Looks like, Looks like it's a pair of legs sticking yeah, out of a, yeah. there's a bottom and a pair of legs. This, oh. I think it's legs as well, mm. with a foot and another leg there. There's something up there as well, I can't quite recognise. This, this um. is the most prominent one. This, like, so this the Roy dog. Yeah, there's one of the posing there, it? Oh. It's, it's oh like my god, look at that. It's like a snarling dog, it's just showing his teeth. Actually, I've just noticed all these multiple eyes here. Well, yeah, it's got little eyes. It's got on these on either side. Yeah. It has like these implanted. These aren't stone. These are something that's been put in. These are like glass. They're like mm, glass like bulbs. Embedded. Bulbs have been bedded. Yeah. Mm. And there's some little ones as well around this side. There. Look at the way it's carved. That's pretty amazing. It's had like teeth put in as well. Is it? Oh, it's part of dog, natural. An old Portland tail which used to live at Cave Hole at Portland Bill. People says he has one red eye and one green eye and none to hunt smugglers and fishermen that passed his caves. If you look closely you can see the eyes of his victims weaved into his first. That's, <laughs> That's what, it what is. they are. Yeah. And if you put an X there it says the Roxy Dog. The oh. Roxy Dog, yeah. <laughs> but you know it's like it's like those, you know, those those mystical hounds you keep hearing about. You yeah, know, like the black, black yeah, dog, Mori do and, and stuff, yeah. And black shuck. Yeah. And these ghost dogs, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, Oz isn't a mystical dog. She definitely leads the trail. <laughs> oh, God bless her. <laughs> and it's like this is very, very well done. Who, who makes these? Well, it's, I think it's quarry men, that are, uh, stonemasons that do the quarry. And I don't know whether they're the guy that actually come off the rock from the, you know, she's had the rock from the fair. See, yeah. Yeah. when you first come in... There you go, look. The oh, there's the, uh, there's the Bohemian Grove Moloch. And up here there's... What's this? Lumps of... Circular. Yeah. Is it a jawbone or something? Yeah. And over here is a seat bed. Mm. You want to sit in it. This one here. Oh, this, this is, is very coral castle, seat, isn't it? Yeah. It's a small seat, but... This is very coral castle-like. This was some. Um, well, Andrew, Andrew Johnson talks a lot about coral castle. I don't know if I'll, see, I'll, I'll fit in it. Shall, shall I film you with that? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is it filming now? It is, it's rolling. Okay. Rolling. And here I am in this stone seat here, like at Coral Castle. I'm like Edward Leeds Scalning. And I'm filming, and uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing place. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the most comfortable seat in the world, but it's, uh, it's very well done. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't sit there for too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's probably some kind of portal that sweeps you away. And here we have like a wedge to jam in between these yeah. two stones. Oh, there's something, there's some reliefs on here, look. There were, someone's carved a relief on there, something. Was it just I don't know what it is. Marks. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's more. Someone's put a wedge in there. 
someone's put a hole in it. Yeah. Like this is this is very similar. There's similarities in to megalithic sites and things like that. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'll stick my own head through. I don't know if I'll fit through here. Oh, not quite. <laughs> but, ooh, <laughs> I'll come this side. You want to yeah, you want to film get a shot of me through there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Cheers, mate. Hello. There Greetings. There you go. <laughs> I'm Neighbors. a leprechaun, I've got a butt of gold! It reminds me of those um, uh, Neolithic stones where yes. people pass through them. And, but There's like one at Cornwall, isn't there? There's one yeah, in Cornwall. You kiss someone as you yeah. go. That it's a kind of front of a crocodile that hasn't been finished. Yeah, some of these are unfinished, but they remind me there's a lot of it is very megalithic in style. Yeah, and look, this is I mean, an that's a before. that looks like a cow of some kind, a bovine, a bison. Yeah. And this one is clearly an, ele an elephant. Or maybe a mammoth, maybe. Yeah. But they've you see that they've changed they've changed certain aspects of the natural rock to make the, they've seen that they found a piece of natural rock that looks a bit like something and they've changed it to make it more like the thing it's supposed to look like. See they had some horns here that are broken off. But that's definitely a cow of some kind, like a bison or a bull of, or a buffalo. Right this area, and this can be our move on down here though. Right sure. Right down here where all the other rocks are that are not carved, but you might actually see some in the stages of carving. Right. Should we head down? Yeah, we can do Is there more of that? Mind you, we're not going to get time really. Yeah, but just do this quick experiment down here. Oh, we need to get to <laughs> this is a really weird location now. We've come to, up, down to this quarry and it's like, it's lots of chaotic uh, lumps of stone. It reminds me a bit of Dartmoor, this, because yeah. there were some quarries there we went to at Dartmoor. This is on an earlier video I did years ago. Why um, it lost in space? It, it is, it is sort of like slightly unearthly here. Maybe it reminds me of uh, something from Arthur C. Clarke or something. You constantly see about Portland these huge articulated lorries saying Portland stone on them. Mm. There'll be nothing left of Portland if they keep taking all the rocks. Oh, exactly, they must be. <laughs> they'll have to stop at some point. Be, yeah, exactly, they'll have to stop at some point. But look at all this. Mm. This is a bit like Mars. Is there a critter crawling up the wall? Yeah. This is like, ooh. yeah, this, these aren't the best shoes for what I've got on now for walking on this kind of surface, but there you go. You see, someone's carved some reliefs on these stones here, um, on these big lumps of rock here. And we're going we're gonna to do our experiment again. And we can, there's less wind here, which is nice. We're going to repeat the experiment we did earlier. Do you want to try this with me? Just hold one end for me. Ben, you hold that in. Yeah, if you hold, did, did it as before, both of you, that's it. I think, Ben, you've got to come around that side. Come on, if you stand there. Is it filming now? Yes. Right, okay, so I'll line it up. So, I think, yeah, if you can turn it round a little bit, just so that it's, and, and pull it tight if you can. I'll move my camera out of the way, actually, because we don't want to trip over there. We don't want water dripping on it. Yeah, there's less wind here, definitely. Yeah. That's good, it's actually a better thing. And you've got a, you could spray with that bottle. Yeah, so let's we'll see if that goes. Squirty, squirty. That's the magic words. Squirty, squirty hurty, Apollo nerty. Fruit loopy. <laughs> Apollo moon, come back soon. It looks like we're dousing it in petrol. Where's, who's got the right? Of course you're going to think that. That's what you're all going to do with the Okay. Like they're the, the globalists and that. So essentially, as if it's the if it's, if it's the fault of the United States, which is not. Yeah. So right. Okay. See there now, you can see the damp on that. See that butterfly? Is it pushing it back a little bit? Now, it's not super super hot here. No, but it's but the sunlight. Now. You can see here, there's damp sure areas. Frame. Yeah. Have to move slightly towards yeah. you, Monica. So. There's damp areas here, and there's light areas here, and there's damp areas here. And obviously, they're starting to dry back as we speak. 
it's still quite wet because obviously I've just literally sprayed it. So I deliberately done it as a comparison to show that it's not shadows. Here is my shadow from the sun and you can see the darkness of the blue over the stars and stripes. So that is definitely a shadow but when I take my hand away you've got the lightness here and this is where the damp is across here, across the stars and stripes. And again there's dark areas on the stars and stripes uh, and lighter areas. A particular part here is where it's dark drying back as well. So, do you think that's a good experiment? Yes, ben? yes. Yeah. It seems. To, I think it's. I think it should reignite the debate. Obviously, Steve Mumbling and the other believers, the Apollo believers, are going to pick holes in it, but they're going to do that no matter what we do. Yeah. yeah. But this hopefully will re will re reignite some interesting debate. Uh. Was it Scott? It was it Scott who noticed it. Scott Henderson, yeah. Canadian Scott Henderson, yeah, brought he noticed this to it. everyone's attention, and it's it's fired off quite a big debate over the mm. past five or six years. So well done, Scott. Yeah, he's for, one of our for Apollo, Apollo detectives. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, I can see a light area here and a dark area here, and you know, I can see it here too as well where it's drying back. I don't know if that's uh, visible on the camera, but definitely a light area here and dark area here. And it's one of these things you can try at home without the help of an adult, everybody. Hmm. Well, you might need an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> if you know any. Yeah, if you know any. But, um, yeah, so we're in the quarry here, and it makes quite a suitable location, um, being that it looks like moon rocks, and that's Monica's suggestion. Thank you, Monica, for that. So there we go. That's really cool. And the other benefit of doing this experiment is that we've got a lovely clean flag. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cool. So, yep, thank you to the Stars and Stripes and the Credit to Amazon for yes. supplying it the next day for our experiment exactly. and the weather. It's an absolutely clear, cracking day here in Portland, which is the weather we were hoping for. Exactly. It's the so. best. You can never completely reproduce lunar conditions on Earth, but this is the closest we can get yeah, to it. I, I can definitely see it drying back here now. Definitely a patch there, definitely a patch here. You see the colour the color differences in the, yeah. the, yeah. the wet the wet and the drunk. Yeah. Hello. Hi. So there we go. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, Neil, Monica, thank Get you very much. Getting all these strange people looking at us. Well, no, we're the strange people, actually. <laughs> There's some more co carvings and sculptures. There's a relief there of some kind of insect on that stone, flying insect like a butterfly, I think it is. Very Elizabeth Kubler Ross, that is. All right, we're going to go up here. And then, oh, we can apparently get a really good view. Um, and, oh, it's nice, yeah. And you can see the sea. There's a ship in the distance, can you see it? Yeah, and another one over there. There's a big white ship, I'm just going to see if I can focus on it. Let's see if I can get a shot of that ship. Oh, it doesn't quite focus. Not to worry. But oh, there's a... There's like an oil tank, big like oil tank. This reminds me of when I was in South Wales at Little Haven. Where we went camping near where the UFOs were. Hmm. Watch your feet if you're filming. Well, it's not, actually it's not ideal. It's not a very good surface here. But yeah, that's the English Channel there. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently there's a cliff edge here, so we've got to be a bit careful. But and we will. We'll be very careful. This looks like something built something, built something there. Looks almost Neolithic, that does. Over there, there's like a stone construction. There's several, actually, yeah. I should take my hat off because I don't want to lose it. It's my Roswell hat. So I don't want to lose that. And you get another fantastic view from over here. Yeah. We've moved slightly round from where we were. That little store, that's where they're going to park the giant barge with the refugees on. This is a bloody awful idea. Here we come to the... And there's the sea, the big expanse of the sea ahead of you. And there's this... Okay, I'm not going to get too close to the edge, but so, there is a cliff. This is why I'm right here, because I'm actually far away, and it's not like, yeah. right below me. Yeah, but look down there. But yeah, yeah. There's someone in the boat now. There's a little boat. Do you see the boat? Let's see if I can get a zoom in on that boat. It looks like they could be fishing. Isn't it? Yeah. And look at look at the, you see some surf down there and there's a, some rocks as the sea comes in. And the view is fantastic here. Which has a beach in the area where the bouncing area of blue. 
moving down across there. You see more, yeah. On the other side of the beach. There's the, inter there's the, there's the, inter there's the internal waterway, yeah. You can, God, you can see the coast curves all the way around there on that yeah. beach there. Yeah. And it's an incredible sight. There's a ship. You could play musical chairs here, couldn't you? Different kinds. And there's actually, I didn't notice this, but there are some carvings on the chair as well. There's a hole in the back of it which goes all the way through. I don't know what that's for. <laughs> anyway, oh yeah, so they can tie, maybe that's so they can tie people up. That's <laughs> where they store the toilet paper. <laughs> Dutch sculptures, there you go. How about that? Mm. It's a, this is a regeneration project linked to activities of the Portland Sculpture and Quarry Trust. For the people of Portland, please respect the sculptures and nature. All right, that's what it is. Group 85, it's in the Dutch sculptures. Well, did I misread that? Butch sculptures. Mm. They look older, actually, because some of them are covered in ivy. Yeah. They're obviously not that old. Yeah. But this is a... Uh... That was lovely. Thanks for showing me that. That's all right. Pause and read this, ladies and gents. But there's all the different birds, the butterflies. There's, uh, there's something about the sculptures. The various things that have been made. And here's another one here. Here's a map of the place. South Quarry, yeah. There we go, it's amazing, that's a really cool. It's, it's a remarkable work of art, it really is. Oh, it's, very, it's very interesting to see that. There's some more things over here. They look like part of Doric columns and things like that. There's the head tops of classic, classic uh, columns and things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They make real sculptures. They don't. They don't just produce big slabs with words like "keep the population under 500 million" and "be not a cancer upon the earth" and all things like that. <laughs> Here we are. Right. Now this may remind regular viewers of York, but it's actually a. It's actually Portland still. We're still at Portland, and we're going to go into Portland Castle. And here's the gates here. And here we are. Here's the Henry VIII's Tudor stronghold, because. Uh, your information slip hazards and, and this is it this is this is and you see by those windows that has like a Tudor look to it, it reminds me of reminds me of Hampton Court you know Neil um, this was built to keep Napoleon out there were cannons and things like that to, to stop his Corsairs from raising raiding the English coast if Napoleon had only come over and rubber dinghies then no one would be able to stop him well, that's right he would have a nice <laughs> he'd have a nice 500 birth bars to sleep in <laughs> yeah <laughs> irony overload yeah. But this has now got, it's got gardens around this, nice. But this was originally a fortress. Look at the, uh, it's, it's made of stone. Everything around here is made of stone. It's the sort of stone, like the sculptures we saw earlier. Look at that there. This is lovely, this reminds me of the Tower of London. And there's the walls of the castle there. And there's these little places here where we can, you can have your little tea and coffee. And you walk along here and there's, there's everything you hold on here. Go through that gate there. And we're just going to start our little tour of the castle now. Here's, here's the window first. This is Henry's gun fort. <coughs> you see, that's what it used to look like. Oh, we just do that. Can we do that? And press play. Did it flip? No. Is yours not working? You can put on speaker phone, there's a speaker bar. Is there? Where, Neil? Well, I can see these buttons oh, yeah. speakers. That's probably uh, louder on C. Can only have it on the Is oh, yours working? It is now, yeah. Right, if you put that to that. Yeah, this is, I'm going to have to get machines and languages in Albanian. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear it. You can hear it. Actually, hear it. I'll, just, I'll put it up to the microphone there. So I have like a... You can pause and read that, guys. It's actually giving me, it's actually giving me, telling me all about it. <coughs> the 
Look at the cannons over there. Some that didn't work, so they got shot. <laughs> oh, oh, very good. Oh. This one looks like it's got a red. Uh, this is cannon here. <laughs> right. There's an old cannon pointing out to sea. It's not going to get far with those guys. Yeah, that's a tank in here, so you can't fire. And here is a, uh, that's Henry himself. Although he probably didn't, he, he probably didn't look as flattering as he did in many of his portraits, because he like had, he had all kinds of diseases, didn't he? He had syphilis and all kinds of things like that. And this is, shows you how you actually oh, use the, so the gun, the, the actual guns. You can pause and read that, guys. Touch here to fire. Right. Press that. Press and hold. No, press, no, touch hold. All right. Or you press that to fire, it doesn't work. And it says put your piece, order your piece load. Search your piece, sponge your piece, fill your lady, pull it, put in the powder, empty on the ladle, sorry, ladle. Put your powder, your wad, regard your shot, put your shot home, put home your shot gently, thrust home your last wad with three strokes, gauge your piece, aim your gun. Right, okay. And this you can dress up in his costume, isn't he? Okay. Ah, oh, look at it. He looks the type. Doesn't this he? doesn't fit. His How do I look, guys? <laughs> looks very smart, doesn't it's it? Yeah, it's a hat. Yeah, it's. I'm like this. Mr. Peel. Oh, oh, very smart. Oh. How smart you are. Yes, indeed. Okay. Oh, oh. You look very, oh, very cool, cool image, cool image. Yeah, I look. I've got to. I'm like Thomas Mayer, I've got two hats on. <laughs> let's get a photo with you then. Oh no, 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 let's get a photo of all of us. Yeah? Yeah. Alright, big selfie. Oh. <laughs> You're this one. How does this work, Doris? You're okay. this side of the camera. Shall I hold it okay. out? I can do that. Does that work? So let me hold it out right here, hang on. <laughs> let me grab that and then. Oh god, the hat. What's that? that? Oh, right, okay. Oh, it's gone blurry. There's a bit of a light behind us. Move you, move. Get the light out from behind us. There we go. That's, That's a bit better. And then another one like that. Well, let go. me just smart my jacket. There's a man behind us. There you go. That's great. <laughs> oh, it really hurts. I can't imagine going back. Where is it? All these diesel oh, guns and there's all these. Tool taken. Very small, oh, smart, yeah. yes. It's very nice you've not put on the clothes, two the clothes there. And these are the various uh, people here, there's the, the various men of the garrison here. Men He's got one of those old fashioned pipes, I found one of those ones, those old clay pipes. <laughs> you see this is the battery, there's like a whole rows of cannon here. Why oh, they'd be pointing out to see, there's like a whole <clears throat> they can they can like fire in any direction because like there's like a whole arc of them. And these things with the force of a thrust, which is almost like rocket thrust. The recoil, right yeah, which is recoil. Called. It has to go far back, so the wall goes right back, you know, three times yeah. the length of the cannon. You'd have to stand to one side when you like yeah. trigger the cannon, <laughs> otherwise, right. otherwise you get run over by it when yeah. it, it, it yeah. fires as the recoil and, pushed and it back. I imagine that you know these rope holes yeah. or something to pull the thing back in. Yeah. I seen them on HMS Victory, they had like literally yeah. a pull they would like fly right back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look at people were actually killed just by the cannons hitting them. Right? Yeah. And uh, not the, the cannon yeah. And if you can see the board has right on target. <laughs> yeah. And um you can see here there's the thick look how thick the walls were. They were designed to resist the impact of of guns from the sea. Like sh um, ships would fire ships would bombard these walls and they're very, very thick, weren't they? So they can get the big guns of the lower gun. Not like the guns of Navarone. 
That's an upper gun, I'm just putting away more guns. Eh? You can pause and read that there. Eh? I'll put my point my I'll point my little there we go. Swim here, look. There's yes. paddle boarders and swimmers. I used to take the kids here. I think oh, there's somewhere around there. Looks like it's a perfect weather for it, isn't it? Yeah. The barge is going to go around there somewhere, I think. I'm not 100% certain. Yes, oh yeah, we've got this. Oh, yeah, we've got this. Look at the shot here, look. It's a pile of shot. Oh yeah. They have like the shot they use for the the coconut shot. Hmm. <laughs> Where about Roche? What do you think? Oh yeah. This here looks like yeah. Look at that. It's, it's a fire blast. You cook. It has to be big to cook all the meat. That's a spit. Yeah. That's probably where they boiled the missionaries. This one. Oh, yeah. <coughs> this is the mess. This is where everyone used to eat. Look at this. Look at the food. Mmm. Francis Thomas on this. Yeah. 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 Y
There's your toilets, and there's a public view. See what we like? We've just, just seen everything around us. Everything a good castle dweller would need. Swords, shields, helmets, <coughs> um, cannon. Uh, little coconut shells to, collect, to, to knock together, pretend you're riding a horse. In case you have to deal with any man-eating white rabbits. And uh, just get a quick look up here at these. He says here, the, the governor's garden. I say it reminds me of the Tower of London. And here we have like a, there's the castle from this side. It's very, very good. That's where we were early up there on that wall. Look at that. There's a speedboat there in the distance. Can you see it? Well, I've, I'm on Weymouth Station now. I've said goodbye to Neil and Monica and now I have to go home. Um, I bought a single ticket to Wool. Genius that I am, I could have sim simply got a return ticket to Weymouth in the first place and saved the money. It uh, probably would have been the same price, but uh, I said I got a return to Wool knowing I wasn't going to come back to Wool because Neil to, to get that train home because Neil had already told me. And now I have a trip home on a train, which I don't like. And it's sad, especially when I'm I had a really nice time and I've got to go home, but I have had a really lovely time. And so I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has um, who has made these last two days so wonderful. Neil Geddes Ward, or Neil Ward as he's called now, uh, Monica, his wife, who, who you've met, and of course everyone at the Daughter Earth Mysteries group. Big thank you to you. Um, this is my train here. I think I might as well get on it in a minute actually, because... Going, it's going in 15 minutes, I think they can might as well just board now. This is a terminus station, so it's clearly just waiting to go back. Uh, yeah, it's been quite something. Anyway, um, if there's any other points of interest on the way home, I will uh, let you know, but I'm not expecting any, so uh, I, might, I might make this the end of the video. So, um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you all for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital Port has pride and dignity. Stop the new world order.